Hello, hello. Hello. How are you doing? I am doing excellent this fine Wednesday afternoon. Oh, good to hear it. Um, okay, up, so what we've got today is um, an Ezra Klein podcast. I've been listening to a few episodes of his podcast recently, and uh, I really like them. And so I saw this one. This was one about uh, where he's apparently interviewing a conservative whose take is that um, our institutions have not earned our trust. We shouldn't trust them. Um, I know a lot of conservatives feel that way, and uh, yeah, and actually, it's not just conservatives. A lot of a lot of people might feel that yeah, way for, for a lot really of different isn't. reasons. Um, so I don't know. Do you have anything else you want to add? Yeah, I guess like my sort of preamble on the whole conspiracy institutions thing is I think um, there's a really uh, there's this thing in our politics where people, particularly younger people, I think primarily as a result of the failures of institutions in the 2000s, be they 9-11 and the things that followed it with the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, um, the security apparatus and the 2009-2008 financial crisis. I think these things created a great overcorrection uh, in the trust and evaluation of our institutions. Um, I think that is the really, um, and it's this really poisonous thing that's just sort of an assumed default in our politics um, with, I think, very little evidence. Um, uh, it's something that, you know, we're just, I feel like we're constantly living in like the phantom shadow of like the World Trade Center from 9-11 because we just cannot get over the idea that, you know, there is some sort of conspiracy um, by a cabal of elites, you know, and it really, is kind of like build your own conspiracy because you see it on the left with corporations or you know if certain people on the left you know the Jews um, certain people on the right also the Jews or people on the right you know woke or you know cultural Marxist or George Soros or the deep state or you know whatever you want it really is a very pernicious ideology that allows you to build an alternate world that can never be unfalsified um, and I think it's a huge huge problem in our politics one of the most pressing ones. I think I, yeah, I, I mostly agree with what you've said, although I, I think it might be the case that prior to 9-11, we might have had too much trust in our institutions, too. So, but but I think yeah. I agree with the idea that, that perhaps we've, like, overcorrected in, in the opposite direction. And, and now, it, yeah, like you said, like, uh, almost anything goes as far as conspiracy theories. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you follow like any of the wildfire stuff that's been happening in different places around the country, but yeah, there's like a direct energy weapons is now like this this thing. The idea that you know it was an intentional fire in Maui, and yeah, that's I heard everywhere. People joking that like Oprah Winfrey started the Maui fire yeah. so her house could have a better view or something. So it's yeah. like, sounds so ridiculous. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, and and it's not even just on Twitter. Like I know some some you know casual normie friends as well, and I remember some people were talking about, well, don't you think it's at least possible? And it's just like, oh Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's possible in the same way that, like, Bigfoot is possible. You yeah. Know? <laughs> hey, hey, man, you never know. The truth is out there. Mm. All right. All right. From New York Times Opinion, this is Let me turn up just show. a little bit. Sorry, what was that? Oh, I was just asking for a, a small uh, uh, increase in volume. Yeah, let me... Perfect, thank you. Hey, it is Ezra. I am on book leave, but this week taking a turn at the mic is Jane Koston. She's a Times opinion writer. She has done years of work covering modern republicanism, conservatism, the populist right, and all of the schisms and fractures within. It's a topic we've been trying to do more work on, so I was grateful she's willing to come on the show and do some conversations around it. Enjoy. In 1964, 73% of Republicans said they trusted the federal government to do the right thing almost always or most of the time. Today, that number is down to 9%. And it's not just the government. You can see that same basic trend for the media, for public schools, for universities. You can't understand the modern Republican Party without understanding this complete collapse in trust in mainstream institutions. Which is why I was interested in having a conversation with Mary Catherine Hamm. Ham is a fourth-generation journalist and conservative writer who has appeared on CNN, Fox News, and ABC News. And a core theme of her work is the way that American institutions, from the CDC to the Department of Education to the mainstream media, have failed again and again to serve Americans. Ham and I disagree on a lot. 
I'm old enough to recall the events that led up to the Iraq War, and old enough to have read a fair amount about FBI surveillance of dissidents and the ways in which so-called objective reporters called LGBT people deviates. So it is slightly amusing to me that Republicans have just now decided that the federal government is worthy of distrust. But I think hers is a perspective that's worth hearing out. First, because there's some real truth to it, but also because it's a perspective that has become dominant on the American right today. As always, you can email the show with your thoughts and guest recommendations at EzraKleinShow at nytimes.com. Yeah, I think that that, that that thing she said just there is going to really be come down to like the core of this entire thing, which is like, what do we mean when we say trust? There's a lot of different things that that could mean. For example, I trust the people at McDonald's to make my food, you know, in a relatively safe way, you know. But I probably would not trust, you know, the people at McDonald's or a restaurant I go to, you know, with my with all of my, you know, bank account information, right? You yeah. know, you might have a friend that you trust. You <clears throat> might have varying levels of, of of trust in your friends and your family. Um, when we say trust, that like could encompass so many different things. So I, I feel I've... like, yeah. I, I feel like it's it's like benevolence, honesty, lo loyalty, and good judgment. Maybe are like pretty much the things that people mean when that they would trust in. Yeah, I, or I, I guess when I hear that, uh, what I'm more thinking is like, well, not just you know trust in terms of like character, but trust to do specific things. Like I do trust the federal government to act in certain predictable ways, and our institutions are built in such a way that they will then act in a way that is generally in our interest. Like I, I, I trust politicians to act generally in ways that are going to get them reelected, and I trust that that is generally going to be by you know uh, promoting what whatever the interests of the people they represent are, um, the interests of, or rather, what the interests of those people are. Um, but like, you know, when you talk to these two people that are very into the conspiracy mindset, you'll often hear things like, you know, do you really trust the government to do what's best for you? And it's like, well, no, not when you put it like that, no. But I trust that like the various institutions of our government are going to get to a kind of middle ground where all the different interests, you know, be them of people uh, and of, you know, corporations and of, you know, different political institutions sort of mellow out in the middle on something that is broadly beneficial to the American public. But, like, that's just not as sexy as, like, you know, can you give a yes or no answer to, like, do you trust them? Yeah, I mean, the government has presided over our society in a way that's gotten us to where we're at now. So it makes sense that if you're satisfied with where we're at now, then you would probably believe that they're going to continue to operate in the way that got us to what you're satisfied with. And if you're dissatisfied with where we're at now, then you, you're going to probably feel the opposite, right? Like. Yeah, and, there, and and there's also just this huge problem of like conglomerating the government, like like it, to a certain degree. Even we're doing right now when we say the yeah. government, it's like okay, well hold on, like are we gonna say that like you know the conduct of the FBI means I no longer trust like the IRS? Like it's really you have to be really specific sometimes with these examples, tuning out like you know because our institutions do sometimes mess up. What do we do with that information? Do we downgrade our trust of all of our institutions of this particular institution? Like there's a lot. It, it, it's a very nuanced and difficult conversation to stay grounded with because there's so many different specifics. That's true. And there are a lot of people who, who will tell you not to trust the government, but then they'll be holding a Blue Lives Matter sign, right? It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mary Catherine Hamm, welcome to the Ezra Klein Show. Thank you so much for having me. So... You've written that this country so desperately needs a reliable narrator and every major institution and figure just refuses to be one. That is the overall theme of a lot of your work is a growing distrust or the state of distrust, largely from conservatives in American institutions. Why do you think that's happened? In large part because the institutions deserve it. I am at heart was raised an ink stained wretch. I'm a fourth generation newspaper journalist. My uh, great grandfather started the illustrious newspaper in beautiful Pitts, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And then his son was a writer for that paper. And then my dad was a newspaper editor and now me. And I worked in newspapers before they fell off a cliff in the uh, mid 2000s. So my take on media is often help me help you. I, I want this to be better. I want to have a fourth estate that is strong that people can believe. And I feel like Far too often, and frankly, during the COVID era, in some pretty obviously disturbing ways, we got past sort of basic 
bias or not knowing what the other side believed and into actual suppression. And that understandably makes people turned off, right? That understandably is a trust issue. And I've spoken about it for years that particularly in media, there's a lack of introspection, despite the fact that trust numbers are so low and we should be very concerned about that as an industry. There tends to be a tendency to put it on the audience. Like, gosh, they're just not receiving us correctly. And it's like, well, maybe we could think about some of the things that we've done that would make them not receive us well. You've talked about the 2016 election as a... Oh, gosh, I really wish there were more specific examples there to contend over. Turning point for you in terms of media trust. I think every major publication published some sort of what happened, right. um, usually with like that headline and that kind of vocal effect. 538 did a version, The Times did a version, The Washington Post did a version. Like, everybody did a what did we do wrong, what happened story. But it's clear that that wasn't sufficient for you and I think for a lot of people. Why? Okay, I'm just going to say this now, just so I can't, you know, retroactively try to change my opinion to make it seem more defensible. The 20, the polling in 2016 was not off. What happened was the models based on polling. There was, there, there, as far as I'm aware, I've never seen any I mean, evidence. The, the polling was off by like 2% or something. It's like mm -hmm. some yeah, nor the, the, the normal poll, amount. Yes. Yeah. The polling in 2016 was well, what was within the standard margin of error. There were some models that absolutely were unjustified in where they went to. I believe it was the Washington Post that had the very infamous Hillary Clinton as like a 99% chance to win. And that absolutely was incorrect. But to say that the polling in 2016 was significantly off is not true. It is true in 2020. There, my understanding is in 2020, the polling did have significant errors outside of the margin of error. And it's funny, she mentions introspection. My understanding is then there was a massive effort on behalf of a lot of pollsters in 2020, uh, in the aftermath of 2020, to try and figure out what went wrong. Why were we so far off? Because even though, it's funny, even though they predicted the correct result in 2020, didn't predict the correct result in 2016, in 2020 they were more inaccurate because of the degree by which they predicted. But it's funny, like, because the result was wrong, everyone thinks of 2016 as much more wrong. But by more, by by actual air, uh, my understanding is the polling was way off in 2020, and they did, did uh, undertake huge attempts to correct that uh, for the 2022 midterms. And I believe um, there wasn't a huge inaccuracy in the 2022 midterms. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I don't particularly like this example, but maybe she's about to clarify it because, to be fair, the person talking about this right now is the is not the conservative representative here. Yeah, I, I'm a little bit annoyed that she threw 538 in, into this, right? When they gave Trump like a 29 percent chance of winning, if I recall correctly, in, in, in 2016. And it's like. I, I don't know that that's like a much better chance than most people were giving them. And then, and then now you're going to like throw them in as an example of people who, who need to like reckon or introspect on what went wrong. It's like I feel like they're like the best example of what went right in 2016 with the coverage. Yeah, yeah. I really hope we go into specifics because we're already kind of jumping between things. She, uh, the conservative person, uh, mentioned suppression, particularly in COVID. And in regards to like the media with suppression, I'm super curious what she's talking about. She's talking about lab leak, or if she's talking about like ivermectin or stuff like that. Because again, these are th these are other things where I think if you actually look at the details, the media is a lot more defensible. You know, not that they didn't make mistakes, but for example, there's a sleight of hand that gets played with lab leak stuff where we talk about suppression of lab lab leak theories that were unintentional leaking, right? A lot of the early lab leak theories were not that it came from a lab, but it was intentionally created and released from a lab. And that is total bull. That, that, that there is absolutely zero evidence. And now later we see evidence that, that you know, it, it is certainly possible, still not proven, certainly possible that it did come from a lab unintentionally. But there's a sleight of hand there. Not to say that there weren't some people, some pieces of the media that did suppress even the accidental leak theory. That absolutely did happen. That's a mistake. But again here, we need to be accurate in our criticisms, right? I mean, if we're going to talk about the, you know, criticize the media for being accurate, we need to be accurate as well here. So I really hope we're, we're going to get down to some more specifics here. Yeah, I, I was going to say, if you hadn't mentioned it, that like there was suppression regardless of that sleight of hand, but, but you mentioned it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I do appreciate an attempt to piece this together. And I think there were some attempts made. They were sort of short lived. And I think after the attempt is made, there's people fall back into the habit of like, we're just going to see this the way we see it. And the concern I had was not that Trump didn't do 
bad things. I was opposed to him the entirety of 2016. I'm on CNN talking about it. But it was that because you can imagine. Oh, I hate that Trump did bad things. God, I hate it when people go, oh, I, yeah, yeah, Trump's a bad guy. It's like, no, Trump's not just a bad guy. He is uniquely horrible. He is uniquely, incredibly, incredibly bad. I don't like, like, the hand waving. Like, like, oh, I hate that so much. Maybe he's uniquely think... among U.S. presidents bad. I don't think he's, like, uniquely yeah, I, I, like... I, Yes, 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 sorry to be clear. Yes, <laughs> that, that's what I mean. Okay, yeah. This person you don't like did a terrible thing does not mean that we have the facts to support that. And I don't want to get there. And I also don't want to disrespect the people who voted for him and write them off, even though I didn't, because that's a large part of the country. And it's a large part of the country that you need to have trust with. The other thing about sort of calling elections, and look, I have no pristine record in this case, but I do think when the entire industry gets something so wrong, which is seeing Donald Trump coming. Now, to be fair, Donald Trump didn't see himself winning. That was a surprise to him. However, yeah, well, hold on. Didn't see Donald Trump coming? Are we talking about? Uh, at first, I would say I, I thought she meant like the emergence of populism, but now it, it sounds like when she's saying he didn't expect himself to win, she's talking about the win again. The 2016 specifically. Yeah, yeah. You know? Again, the 2016 win. Yeah, again, that, that's that's just not true. At least for like actual polls, we're talking about models. Absolutely. However, I thought, man, it is a problem if we all put our TV dresses and our ties on the next day and tell everybody. Well, here we are to just analyze again. Well, you just really, really messed up. If you don't own up to that in that moment, I think people go, oh, great. They're just putting on their act again and they're not being trustworthy. Can we pause for a second? So, like, I've always thought that. I, I think despite all the objections we're raising to her, that I think the point that she's making is basically fair, though, right? That, that like, um, that there was a lot of. Uh, <laughs> Like poor, you know, poor judgment shown leading up to the 2016 election. Bad, bad coverage that that kind of like misled people about what was likely to happen, and and that it makes sense for people to downgrade their trust in the media broadly because of that. Mm, I agree that that happened. I think I I I, I would I would disagree, and really. I would want, I guess, I'm skeptical of the extent to which she's saying, although to be honest, like, it's not like I have, it's not like I, I, I'm thinking about a study, I'm just thinking myself back to the coverage then. I'd be curious, I'd be curious if there could be any sort of like, you know, retrospective, like, analysis of the media, of like, uh, 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 of this kind of bias, because I'm really hesitant to agree that this was like an overwhelming problem. No doubt, places, places like, you know, the Huffington Post or the Washington Post were definitely, um, you know, we're definitely wrong in their coverage of Trump. Yeah, I don't well, disagree it, there. It need not. It, it doesn't have to be a case of bias, right? It could. It could be that they just honestly, you know, they believed that a thing was going to happen in a certain way, and they had like, you know, somewhat decent defensible reasons for believing that Clinton was going to win, right? But but then they covered it in such a way that that like probably gave people unrealistic expectations about about their like certainty in that, right? Yeah, I think um, I think I think there's like a dual component here. On the one hand, I'm skeptical about the uh, degree to the problem. Uh, I don't know if it was extreme as extreme as she is saying. And particularly when you start to narrow that down, what you, when you start to say, you know, oh, it wasn't 80 percent of the media, it was 60 percent, it was 30 percent, it was 20 percent of the media. Now what you're saying is the left 20 percent of the media was biased against Trump. Absolutely. But the right twenty percent of media is also, you know, is also biased towards Trump. So then it doesn't feel fair to say, you know, the media. Like there's a great discounting of like Fox News or Breitbart. Oh man, 2016 Breitbart. I remember I I was browsing 2016 Breitbart like every single day, and there were some wild headlines coming out of there. Um, and I, so so like that's the first component. And the second component is I don't then necessarily agree with where we're going with this. If it was the case in the aftermath of 2016, people said, you know what, we are going to downgrade our confidence in uh, outlets when they say that it's likely that a Democrat is going to win. I would be like, okay, 
That, I think, is, is a much more defensible conclusion. But instead, people are like, oh, you think the vaccine is safe? You trust them after they got 2016 wrong? It's like, what are you talking about? The, the, I, 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 it's like we mentioned earlier, the nuances of, of which institutions are what, and when one institution does fail, as there were failures in the news media in 2016, what insta what, what is our conclusion? I feel like people go way off it. Like, like it, it becomes a license to ignore anything you don't like that comes from, from an institution or a figure of authority. That's what it feels like. Yeah. It feels like people, people. And, uh, another example of this: people, people will will never agree with polls until it comes to Biden's unapproval rating. Oh, the polling's inaccurate. The polling's inaccurate. But as soon as there's a poll that shows Biden's really unpopular, oh, the polling's onto it. Biden's over. Like there's this selective skepticism that gets applied as, uh, using 2016 as a justification, which is where like, it, it, which I think is where I really start to get lost from this like uh, argument. Uh, yeah. So what I think is going on here is th is that our human brains are basically the way that we process trust is like it's. Yep like the kind of trust you have in a personal relationship is the same kind of trust you might have with like the institution and people don't think of the media as this like disparate thing that you can have like different levels of trust in it. well i mean to some extent they do but but it's so you know if you think of the media as just one big thing th then it's like Okay, it, it makes sense that like trust is difficult to build and easy to destroy in a in a personal relationship, right? So if mm -hmm. so if somebody like lies to you once, it like actually does like probably should ding your trust in, in them in a. And that's totally fair. That's totally fair. And I, and I think that that's kind of what people are doing with like 2016, for example. That they're just like, oh, these people are supposed to be honest with us, but the media lied to us about what was going to happen. I'm just going to ding my trust in all of them because of that, and you know, and 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 of course, leading up to this, we've got a couple of decades of uh, of like conservative media complaining about bias in left wing media, right? Um, like like all going all the way back to. To like Rush Limbaugh has been doing that since the 1980s, like te yep. tell you know, but um, so so I do think bias is is certainly part of it. Like it like there's a a certain portion of the audience, like conservatives especially, who are going to be like predisposed or or primed to to already distrust, you know, ba based on that. Um, but so you know, I just don't. I don't think it's only a matter of being biased toward one side or the or the other, right? I I also think it, like it is true that a lot of these people delivered their message or interpreted this data in in a with undue confidence, and that you probably should trust their judgment a little bit less because of it going forward. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and again, that would be totally fair, but but I think it just gets wielded, you know, even outside of the media and even inside the media. It also then gets wielded, you know, it would be one thing to say, you know what, I really do not put a lot of stock when the Washington Post has an opinion piece about the blue wave. That's totally fair. If yeah. you said a 2016 for that, I'd be like, you know what, that's a good goddamn argument. But instead, people will be like, the New York Times is fabricating evidence. When they say they have, a, they, they have an anonymous source, that's them just lying. How do I know? Look at 2016. 16, bro. Yeah. It's like that's the kind of stuff that makes me want to tear my hair out. That the idea of quote unquote trusting media seems misplaced to me. For one thing, I've noticed that a lot of the people who are like very angry at the New York Times still have New York Times bestselling writer in their Twitter bio. There's really a sense of like, it's an authority when we want it to be, and it's not an authority when we're mad at it. True. For another thing, a lot of the people who will say that they distrust media, they trust somebody. Should they? To my mind, what I end up doing, and this is something that I think um, the former Twitter, the artist formerly known as Twitter, was actually good for, is that when I joined Twitter many, many years ago, too many, you could cultivate this personally tailored stream of people you trust. Now, that, of course, means on left and right that often you end up with a stream of people, people who agree with you. Mm -hmm. I attempt very proactively to fill my feed with people I do not agree with. I attempt to read don't, their stuff in good faith and disagree in good faith. I grew up in an all liberal town. If I had not been able to disagree in good faith my entire life, I would have had no one <laughs> to talk to. And so that's an important part of how I think you can gain perspective on news. I don't pick outlets. I generally pick reporters or I pick commentators who I feel like are dealing with me on the facts, who will tell me stuff that is uh, against perhaps the prevailing narrative, because that takes some courage. That to me.
But see, like, when she says, I pick reporters and not outlets, that's great, but that's not what most people are doing. Most people are talking like, oh, CNN, nothing I can trust from them. Yeah, like, for sure. He is one of the parts and to be of fair, the media people that left you that too. Some people are like, oh, Fox News, is ignore it. You are it. forming your own sort of newsroom personally, and then to challenge yourself and make sure that, that newsroom is not everyone who agrees with you. Because I say this all the time, I speak on college campuses as the one weirdo right winger they invite, and I say, be the weirdo in the room. It's hard, but rooms need weirdos because they need their ideas tested. And I attempt to have a little bit of backbone to occasionally be that weirdo. Right. There's been this constant discussion. You know, a lot of my work has focused on covering conservatism in the age of Trump. And a lot of the criticism I've gotten is that either I am giving cover to the worst elements of some of American society by trying to make sense of it and trying to put it into some sort of conservative parlance or putting it into context, or I'm not being nice enough to very nice conservatives. And this is how we got Trump, which I've always thought to be such a funny argument that like things were awful. And that's why we had to get this guy we like, like, that's not how that works. But a lot of publications are thinking about how do you cover or to use the term platform, which I actually kind of hate because that kind of implies that you are just like, you know, you pick somebody up and you're like, here you go. Right. I think that conservatives might remember in 2020, NPR did an uh, interview with someone who wrote a book about how riots essentially were good and that riots were a good idea. And this was this interview with this person who had written this book. And I think some of the coverage of that book that I saw in right-leaning outlets was essentially, one, how dare this person write this book? Two, how dare this person's book get covered in NPR? And three, how dare this person's book and ideas get engaged with on NPR and any outlet? And so I'm curious how you think about this problem of, one, what, what does it even mean to platform? Are we saying that this idea is good or bad, even if you get to see it? Two, pause here for a second? how do you in um, I, th I think this point that she's making does does make a lot of sense for certain portions of the right wing, right? Like there are a lot of people who, who will like talk about how great free speech is. And then also they're like, but also we have to ban CRT, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, I think there is um, uh, JJ McCullough. I don't know if we this is one of the videos we reviewed. He has a great video where he talks about like uh, like some of like the archetypal like left wing personality type has sort of like infiltrated the right. It's like become the basis of a lot of right wing people. Like someone like Candace Owens. If you turn off, if like you like blanked out the specific issues, you know Candace Owens, this young woman, outraged at these things and saying we need to take action and we need to stop these things. You know we need to boycott this stuff. Really sounds like a left wing. Um, she, she He's mirroring uh, like, a, a, like a left wing style of rhetoric and, ju and just yes. employing it in service yes, yeah. of the right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it's very true. Um, You know, I don't think it's necessarily some huge dunk on the right, but I think it's very noteworthy yeah. and helps you understand a lot that a lot of, I think, the thought of the new sort of more populist right is almost an offshoot of some of like the like fundamentally like left wing anti establishment stuff in the 2000s. And I think you can even kind of see that direct line when you look at some of like the really out there like populist left people that have now over time migrated to the right people like jimmy Dore, um people like oh god what's the british actor um that has the show now oh gosh i'm not gonna remember this guy's name he's a uh, russell brand uh, uh jimmy Dore, russell brand um yeah you know i, I think these uh, uh crystal ball is not quite on that level um i think when you look at some of these people you can really see the you can really trace the thread of how what was originally a, a very left-wing based school of thought has sort of morphed into and has become the basis of what is, you know, the new right. Um, again, not to say that that's good or bad. I, I mean, I think, you know, when we talk about the labels of what is left and what is right, like they're ultimately like, you know, useful tools, but they don't mean anything. You know, maybe in another 20 years, if things continue like this, we will now say, no, this was a left-wing thing, but now it's definitively a right-wing thing. Maybe that'll be the case. Um, but I just think it, it, is, it, it is very instructive and revealing of the dynamics of the new right wing. Uh, yeah, so one thing I have heard people say about the about the you know modern conservative movement in the last few years is that it seems less like a movement that has values of its own and it's more like a movement that exists just to push back against the left.
Yeah, I think yeah, there's a real problem of not being able to unite on issues. I think in particular because there's this huge divergence. You know, the the, the new right. You know, Vivek Ramaswamy, Trump. They're not super big on corporations. You know, you look at the fight. You know, they're, they're not big like the neocons and, and, and neocons, Rhino. That's those are terms of uh, those are derogatory terms. Those are insults that those people uh, 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 wield. Um, and I think there's uh, um, there's sort of this um, chicken in the egg scenario where on the one hand, when that's the case, you totally, you know, I can totally understand why Fox News talks about culture war stuff um, because it's the kind of thing that appeals to both the new right and the traditional right. But as the as the as you know days turn to weeks turn to months turn to years and more and more of the right wing ecosystem spends all their airtime talking about culture war issues well then also it's no surprise that's the only thing that you can unite on anymore because it's all you talk about you know on a certain level i think you know part of the reason why the right is so obsessed with culture wars is because it's all they focus on anymore which then because it's the only thing they care about it's what they focus on which then is, becomes the only thing they care about like it really seems like this vicious cycle that, that i think they've kickstarted now where it is so hard for Republican candidates to try and keep themselves open and available to the wide range of Republican voters now um, without leaving, um, uh, without exclusively staying in the realm of culture war issues. Um, I don't know if you saw the RNC debate uh, last Wednesday. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I was, um, I, I was uh, amazed how, how, how fresh it felt for them to be talking about issues that weren't transgender people, CRT. I mean, they got into a little bit of that, but <laughs> yeah. um, but 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 you saw some sparks fly in regards to like you know Ukraine versus you know Trump's indictment versus you know whether or not Republicans spend too much when they have administrations, and it was it, when that happened, it was just like oh my god, I realized it's been so long since I've heard Republicans argue with each other, uh, talk about anything that wasn't like trans issues, trans issues. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, trans issues or like Trump centric stuff. Yeah, yeah engage with those ideas some you know extreme ideas or extreme again take your pick of what that means with context and pushback while making it readable perceivable you know, how do you think about that yeah so on the platforming question i'm in favor of just like really wide latitude on the ideas that adults can engage with now i think the argument on the npr coverage of that book is that Okay, you have a book that's explicitly saying writing can be great. Mm -hmm. And the idea that a similarly extreme take on the right would get similar coverage in the same out outlet, I think is mm -hmm. on its face obvious that that would not happen, right? right? So I think a lot of it comes from that. Like, this is legitimized while we are pathologized. You can engage with this stuff without maybe doing either of those things. Mm -hmm. So I think, like, a wide latitude is good. That's an argument I'm not necessarily opposed to. Yeah. The idea that, listen, NPR can have this book, but it's kind of bullshit they're having this book and not some of our books. And you know what? I think there's probably there's definitely some truth there. There absolutely is, I think, a left-wing bias in NPR. I don't think that's that controversial to say. Yeah. Um, and they could definitely do better about platforming, you know, uh, being even-handed with more fringe ideas that they platform. <laughs> Um, but I don't think that's what most conservatives were saying. Certainly some, certainly uh, uh, this this woman is, but uh, I, do, I, I don't think that that was the overwhelming argument. I think there are a bunch of right-wingers and conservatives who do want that stuff to be viciously deplatformed, don't want it to be allowed. Uh, yeah, uh, th this is an argument I'm a lot more, you know, uh, open to, but I but I don't think it's fair to characterize, you know, what conservatives were really saying was, oh, well, it's not. no, they weren't. That's total bullshit. When it comes to platforming Trump, like, well, he's the, by a vast <laughs> lead, leading candidate for one of the major mm -hmm. parties. So I disagreed with the idea that Licht had gone wrong in having him in this town hall. Chris Licht, former Chris Licht of, uh, formerly of, of CNN, CNN, had the, uh, the Trump town hall. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the interlocutor was uh, Caitlin Collins, mm -hmm. put her up there, asked some tough questions. Now, would I have done it slightly differently? I think he was very brazen about, oh, yeah, it is a super pro-Trump crowd, mm -hmm. and I would have maybe had some more ground rules for that, which I think would have made it a better situation. So some of it is just reading the room. However, I think you can engage with plenty of ideas and critique them without denigrating entire parts of the population who might 
also be engaging with those ideas. I also hate the idea on TV or Twitter or whatever it is. This happened a lot during the Trump years. That If you engage in providing context and saying, okay, well, how big is this Trump offense? Let's mm-hmm. compare it to things we've seen in the past. That that is treated as Trump boosting. Mm-hmm. I actually think the context is bringing us closer to understanding this issue than further away. So I I don't like the idea that engaging in walking through each of these things and not imagining your Trump narrative as opposed to really comparing it to history, that that's off limits, that that makes you some kind of sellout, because I think you're actually informing people. I, I, I think I super agree with all of that. I, I, again, I, I wish we'd go over more specifics here um, because I, I, I don't know that the problem is as pre- prevalent as you're saying, but, but, but it definitely is there. For example, the, the one example she did give with that Trump town hall that happened, I want to say something like nine, ten months ago. Um, it might have been more recent, but it was it, 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 it was within the last year. Um, I, I, the, the, I I did see some a, a decent amount of criticism from more of like the establishment resist lib type group um, groups, and I do think that was unfounded. Mm-hmm. So we've seen this conversation more recently with Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and his views generally centering on vaccines, but also ranging from believing that the Koch brothers should be sent to prison to something about COVID as a bioweapon. I think that there have been a lot of good arguments about how his views are shared by some people. And his views deserve to be heard and then contested. But I'm curious as to your thoughts as to I I, I wrote down crack pottery, which I've decided now I really like that as a noun. But each of us and I think, you know, we kind of have a general consensus as to the crack pottery. We're like, we'll listen to this. And the crack pottery, we're like, no, this isn't acceptable. Out and out Holocaust denial, for example. So. In a country as broad as ours and with media whose incentives are there because it's grabby and interesting and the incentives to cover him, especially for conservatives who don't like Joe Biden very much, are very much there. But I am interested in how you think about like anti-vaccine views we can engage with. Holocaust denial can't engage with. How do we think about whose crack pottery we listen to and engage with and again challenge to be clear and who's are we like nope that's anathema i think it's a sliding scale i would like the parameters to be like way out here mm-hmm. on the left and right just because i'm pretty crack potty myself on that just on the on the idea of airing these things mm-hmm. so i want the parameters to be wide i also think what rfk jr is tapping into well he's covered one because like he's a kennedy and he's getting not a small amount of percentage in this non primary race that's sort of happening under it's the radar. It's a small percentage. He's getting equivalent to many and yeah. more percentage points than many of the <clears throat> GOP contenders against mm-hmm. Trump, right? So I think that's interesting because there's a market that's being served here. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of coverage has attempted to sort of pin him on the right. Like, he's a man of the right. I'm like, well, he's literally a Kennedy running in the Democratic primary. So I'm not sure about that. But I think what oh, people that's a horrible miss argument. in yeah. trying to make him a man of the right is that there's a real coming together of the right and left. Now, some of it is crack pottery, but in this area of massive distrust and that there's a real reason for it. I think Michelle Goldberg nailed it in her column about him. He is the candidate of the distrustful. Mm -hmm. And those folks, because they have been lied to or misled on other things, are going to be inclined to believe they're not hearing the truth on many things. And some of the things they really are, right? This is the I'm sure it's, oh, it's probably specific, but it feels very much the problem of our time is parsing when I think I'm getting the straight story from institutions, from media, and telling people, no, 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 you're you're conspiracizing about this thing. Except then that thing like sort of ends up being true. Mm-hmm. And like I what? have to mea culpa on that and be like, I like don't want to be reasonable, but you actually were correct about this one. They were hiding the ball on this. What? So we have a real problem with that. And it does create well, my God, she's not going to give grounds for more conspiracy theories. Right. We, we okay. still got like 40 more minutes. Maybe yeah, we so we, we, we've, got time. we've got time. We've got time. Yeah. We're going to bring it back. We're going to bring it back. Um, 
I, 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 I thought she was kind of cooking in the middle there when she talked about there is a basis for this on the left. I 100% agree. I think it's much worse on the right. Honestly, I don't really know why that is. I don't, you know, I don't think that, you know, right wingers are fundamentally like dumb or bigoted or, you know, uh, are, are mistrustful. You know, I, I, I think all people are, are wrong about many things. And, you know, that is just as prevalent on the left as it is on the right. For some reason, it seems like it just doesn't come together uh, on the left at this particular point in time in history in this particular place. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know really why that is. You yeah, know? I think it um, would have been the opposite 20 or 30 years ago, though. But yeah. 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 Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, when you talk about these like left leaning people, especially the old school ones that are coming over, you can see that basis on the left. You can see, I think, a lot of unjust, you know, I do not support the Afghanistan or Iraq wars. Uh, I do not support the massive uh, surveillance state we had in the aftermath of 9 11. But there are a lot, th there's a decent chunk of people on the left that have a lot of opinions about those that aren't based in reality. Like, like the belief that we went into Iraq or Afghanistan for oil is totally unfounded. Um, and, 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 but still sticks around, even though 20 years later, we didn't get any oil. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, there absolutely is that uh, on the left. I, but then she said, there's a reason for it. There's a reason, but I don't think it's a justified reason. Um, I, I, or rather, I don't think they are justified in that belief. Um, I, I, the reporter brought up a really great question, which is, okay, we all agree there's some views that, you know, probably should not be up for debate. You know, the Holocaust denial is one, you know, there's a much, there are much more spicy ones, you know, like, I don't think there are any Republicans out here that think, you know, CNN should have a panel on whether or not, you know, child porn uh, should be legal. We probably all agree, you know, that's probably one that we don't need to have. Uh, but then where do we draw the line? Where do we draw the line? That's an interesting question. And it's a sliding scale. That's not an answer. What does that mean? What, 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 how do we define the scale? Like, I understand you're not gonna be able to give me an exact number on like, if it is 25.3% unjustified then the but like I need something you know you might as well have said nothing if you're just gonna say it's a sliding scale like I I, I feel like this is like a really hard question that they that there just wasn't engagement over uh, yeah it's it does sort of feel like she's throwing out the critique without presenting a better alternative or something but yeah like what Talk is the media supposed to do in in that kind of coverage? Like what? what yeah, you... yeah. Oh, it, oh, yeah. And sorry, that's the other thing. The other thing that I think is not being mentioned here is the reason the me media does what it does is because that's what's profitable. That they are a business model, right? The reason why they aren't covering R R RFK that much is because, like, you, I'm sorry, outside of Twitter, almost no one cares. Almost no one actually cares about this stuff. You know, people do care about the Trump stuff, right? And, and, and you know, especially on the left, you know, the classic resist libs, you know, they love Trump coverage. So, of course, you can cover it. Same thing on the right. People on the right love coverage of the border crisis. So, of course, they're, you know, right, right wing uh, are going to focus on it more. And that, that's a totally fair critique. You know, that's a far cry from they're making stuff up. That's a totally fair critique. And I think that is actually one of the biggest places where you see bias in news media is not in the coverage, but in what gets covered in the first place. How many articles does CNN run on the Hunter Biden story versus how many does Fox do? Or reverse, how many articles does Fox run on the newest, you know, tr on the newest damning Trump indictment versus how many does CNN do? That's a very fair criticism. Mm -hmm. um, but, 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 but the but reasons are a lot more mundane. Right? Like the, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's the reason why I think is because they are businesses and they see what gets the clicks. Yeah. Uh, it's the same reason, you know, clickbait is a thing. You know, it works. You know, <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I, I, I am not innocent in this. I've clicked on many. I've seen many article be like, that's such fucking bullshit. Let me read this goddamn article <laughs> so I can see how stupid it is. You know, it, 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 it works. But I just wish we could have more honest conversations about why these problems exist instead of having to like run to like, and it's because of, ooh, you know, they, they're trying to cover it up. Like, no, it's because, you know, wine moms in Oregon love to hear about this stuff and they're going to click on it and then they're going to see an ad and the Washington Post is going to make one tenth of a penny. I, I wonder if that applies a little more broadly to some of the stuff about distrust in institutions, though, right? Like, like if you run a story that that's like, oh, my God, our institutions have failed us, that probably gets more clicks than a story that, you know, that. It's, oh, oh my God, things are working as expected. <laughs> yeah, and, and really, I think it's less stories and saying that with pundits, 
right? It's the same thing with like Twitter or, you know, even we see in a smaller scale in like Twitch politics, you know, when Tucker Carlson comes out and says, you know, they hate us, they're against us, they want to destroy us. That gets people riled up way more than, you know, being like, well, the thing is, these businesses just want to optimize for the most amount of revenue. So they're going to make article like it's a lot more interesting and engaging. And, you know, it's fun. It's more fun to hear that, like, it's us against the world. It's us against the elite. It's us against the cabal, the deep state, you know, the corporations. Mm hmm. This rising distrust, but that seems to me to rely on a halcyon story of American institutions, including the media, a version in which there used to be a limited number of media institutions, and they would all kind of generally agree on what got covered and what didn't get covered. And you see again and again how stories that were impactful, you know, if you go back through the New York Times archives and just look for the word homosexuality, how stories that were particularly impactful in the lives of minorities from African Americans to LGBT people were just not covered or covered them as if they were speaking for a general audience that thought they were weird and gross and should be isolated. And so the idea of distrusting major institutions, including the media, seems to be just kind of how we should generally feel. You know, that old story for journalists no. that if your mother tells you that she loves you, you should like double check. Should that just be how we think about institutions? Yes. And I no, you can't. You can't double check. How are you supposed to double check like a vaccine? Like I heard, I I heard the vaccines are safe. Okay, well let me call up my friends. Let's get a randomized double blind control study. Let's get some manufactured. Like, ugh. You can at least like funny. listen to different media sources, which isn't quite the same thing as double checking, but it, but at least yeah, it, yeah. yeah. A moment of unity from the CNN set over those Trump years, but Angela Rye and I used to be on together. She's certainly a left-leaning mm -hmm. commentator, I would say quite liberal. We're far apart on issues, but we are not far apart on distrust of institutions. And so when there was a widespread compulsion to just say like the intelligence community and the FBI are full of unassailable public servants mm -hmm. doing what we need them to do and how dare you <laughs> try to question the work that they're doing i need specifics angela and i would look at each other and be like i mean is this the fbi that, that spied on mm -hmm. martin luther king is that what? That's the oh my god there's no way they just said that there's no way they just said that why the fbi is still liable for the conduct regarding martin luther king mlk 60 years ago just say just say you, you can never trust anything just say you can never trust anything because if that's the standard you can literally never trust anything you know my my friend cheated in a board game you know t five years ago when we were in the middle of high school bro I guess he can't be the best. I guess he can't come to my wedding. Sorry, bro. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's just like, oh my gosh, especially when there have been explicit changes to the institution since 60 years ago. And by the way, this particular person might be totally fine with what I'm about to say, but anytime someone makes this argument, I want you to ask, particularly if they're on the right wing, I want you to ask that person, oh, you think the conduct of law enforcement during the 60s can inform them on our on, on their trustworthiness? So you must think like every police department is massively racist, because if the conduct of the FBI 60 years ago in regards to MLK can color them today, well, let me tell you about the conduct of like every police department during the 1960s back in the day. Like, mm -hmm. let me just tell you about how unbelievably bad that was. But, but, no, but no, no one does. No, and but that was a that long example, time ago. Okay. You're supposed to get over that. <laughs> yes, yes. And, but what's even, what's even, what's even so frustrating about it is you look at that example and you immediately see why it falls apart. Because the ghosts of police officers from 60 years ago are not possessing people today and controlling them. There obviously have been changes in the culture and the attitudes and the opinions and the conduct of local police departments 60 years ago. But because it's the FBI, big three-letter agency, it just becomes like this black monolith from 2001 that is mm -hmm. imperceptible. We can't know anything about what goes on it and it's just do we trust the fbi or do we don't oh my gosh i just that is just so stupid mm -hmm. this is where i think again the historical context can be helpful to people uh, oh, oh okay, okay, when you're talking okay. about this instead uh, of okay, can we pause for a second I, I wonder if if anyone would take a view like that on on like foreign policy right would people say like we can't trust the british because of the british empire or something you know what i mean it just sounds like i don't know i think germany's really hostile to jews i mean look at what happened in 1940s like oh uh, 
Yeah, I, I mean that's probably like the most egregious example of of a company that or of a country that's like you know turned around drastically ideologically. But but like you know you know nevertheless, yeah, it doesn't really make any sense to say like we can or can't ally with a country because because of something that they did several decades ago. And like I don't see why it would be that much different with like a government agency. Yes, yes, and 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 and. and, and... And it is also so telling that it's like, we can't trust them. Why? If they had great evidence, they would be bringing it up. But instead, they go back to like, well, 60 years ago, they did this thing. That's the best you've got? That's your that, that's exhibit A in your trial? Are you kidding me? It's probably not exhibit A, but, but it's it, the fact that it's it, even I, like... It is, it, it, it is a lot of the time. I, I'll at least give credit to like, you know, someone like Rob Knorr. He'll bring up like the text of, I think it's Peter Strzok, the FBI guy from Crossfire Hurricane. Like, at least that's like, oh, okay, this is potentially something. You know, let's look into it. But when you're, when your first go-to example of the corruption of the FBI is the conduct of ML... Of, in, of the 60, in the 60s! In the 60s! It was, it's like... In 200 years, when we're on, like, Twitter, metaverse, you know, AI spaces, there's going to be people that are going to be like, oh, you trust the reports about Pluto's nuclear detonation? How come they got the election in 2016 wrong, dumbass? It's like, <laughs> we're, it's just like, it feels like we're never going to get over this, dude. Yeah, it's like, don't you know that people believed the, you know, the world was flat thousands of years ago? How could you ever yeah, trust anyone yeah, again? Yeah, like, like, oh, science was wrong before. It's like science was wrong before, bro. First off, how how did we learn that science was wrong? How did we correct the it's through science? It's through the scientific process. So you can't be like, I don't trust the scientific conclusions now because scientific conclusions in the past are wrong. We only know they're wrong because of scientific conclusions. But I, but what do you want to bet? Like a bunch of the uh, science stuff is probably going to come up in you know in the in this conversation oh God, in the context right. of like oh COVID. Oh God, you're right. <laughs> but yeah, make people give examples. Make people give examples because when they do, and see now I'm wondering. I'm wondering all these previous things were her examples when when she was talking previously about like the media suppressing stuff. Is it going to be this kind of stuff, or is it going to be the more reasonable stuff? Like you have to give examples, people. You have. To, I'm sorry. You have to give examples because when you just say something generic, multiple people can see the same thing when it comes to different conclusions. And it's important to have like a unified like understanding of what a statement is, so when we can reject it or accept it, you know, we can have an understanding of reality that's shared. So we can have conversations and come to prescriptive outcomes. Okay, or, uh, Newtonia, who's in my chat, please don't tell people to kill themselves. Thank you. <laughs> oh, he's in your chat. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're probably getting him from me. Newtonia is. Uh, no, I know. He, he was in my chat right last week. Okay. He, okay. He, he, he called me uh, like a communist and then a fascist and then a postmodernist. Oh, all, he called me a communist about like 15 weeks ago. Minutes, so, you know. Yeah, he's, I, yeah I, he's, he's, he's kind of a crazy I, person. I haven't minded him up until now, but, but you know, but please don't tell people to kill themselves in my chat, okay? That's all. Go on. Yeah, so much for the tolerant, right? So. Trump booster by yeah. a long shot, but she has a healthy distrust of an institution that has earned that distrust. I think one of the problems with media is it does appear to me and it does appear accelerated in the past 10 years or so. When one side is in charge of the institutions, there is far less skepticism. I would like there to be tons of skepticism all the time. I struggle with how not to tip into cynicism, but I am largely skeptical of all government endeavors, and they have the power, unlike any other institution, to violently withhold your freedom. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important. It's important to ask questions of them. And if my side is in charge, that doesn't mean that things are going swimmingly. I don't want to go back to a time when there were three newscasts and that all the facts came from those people. I love that the internet gives us primary coverage, primary documents that you can go back and read yourself that are not filtered through someone else. Now, you're going to build your own filters. And not that filters people actually do that almost ever. Yeah, I really hope she's going to like acknowledge or address the fact that no one does this. To in the past, from government, from candidates, from events that you were not I, I'll at. agree with her. It's and good that we can. I think that that's well. important and valuable. And I think perhaps people are more distrustful because they see more things. There's more available to them to parse these things. And then sometimes I think they're wrong, but they're seeing more of the picture sometimes and seeing what was kept from them, just as other populations had seen that earlier. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking about institutions that are made up of... Oh, she's not. They're just going to move on. Yeah, like, 
I'm inclined to agree with her, like, in a vacuum. Like, yeah, I want people to have access to more information. But, like, you need to be... I need her to give an answer for, like, the obvious... The elephant in the room, which is, like, if this is true, why are people out here talking about, like, 5Gs turning the frogs gay? Like, why is there this massive problem of people believing in all these rampant conspiracy theories? Like, you need to have an, an, an answer for that. Yeah. A lot of actors and many complex organizations, you know, talking about the media. How do you think about rebuilding an institution, even if you can say the media is an institution, where there's no central governing body that drives the media? Look, it is all distributed and it is all changing. This is uh, not to get too like existential about it, but we talk about these institutions as if they have been in stasis at any particular time, right? They have been changing with administrations. They have been mm -hmm. changing with cultural winds. They have been changing with economic forces for decades. I mean, I watched newspapers falling off the ledge, right? That happened right when I was in them in 2004 or five and happened to move to sort of a new media position. and was like, Hey, look at that. But these things have been changing for a long time. I do not know how you institute like, for instance, a cultural understanding that raucous debate and free speech is good, which I think is should be the default position of journalists. Once that cultural understanding is gone, particularly in elite universities, from where many journalists are coming, I don't know how you reinstitute that. You know, it would be nice so when you come into an organization that is ostensibly a practitioner of free speech. Maybe there's a onboarding that includes some talk of that and why it's important, uh, because they're not getting it in often. In college, in the context of that, you can talk about the problems that we must grapple with while we're having that conversation, right? But I do think, you know, there's plenty of money spent on onboarding about many, many, many other issues. And perhaps that should be one of them that is part of the discussion in your training when you come to a new journalistic endeavor. I was really worried it was just going to be, I don't know. But that's actually a fair suggestion there. You know, if we have training for the importance of diversity, why not have training for the importance of open, you know, debate? That's not, that's not the worst idea I've ever heard. Well, I, I would imagine if you go to school for journalism, you probably do get into that, right? Well, I would think so, too. But she seems to be contending the opposite, talking about how, you know, particularly when uh, that cultural understanding takes root in universities. And that's where many of them come from. Uh, and, and, and certainly, I think there are definitely a, a lot of universities that have gone too far in, in the direction of not have, be, having open uh, debates. I, I actually do 100 percent agree with that criticism of the right. Well, not 100 percent, but, 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 but I mostly agree that uh, I think a lot of universities do not have as nearly uh, as open of a debate uh, um, as open of a culture to discussing controversial ideas as I wish they would. Yeah, well, and definitely less than they used to. And, and you yeah. know, th I think th there's room to disagree, you know, on the platform in question of like, how much should we even, you know, have open debate about about this idea versus that one, right? But but I mean, generally, I, I, I agree with her take that, you know, that she gave earlier on the platforming thing too, that, that we should probably have like a, a pretty wide range of acceptance of things that are, that are you know, considered acceptable to discuss. And, and um, yeah, and, and like her, I do, I do also wish that that would be more of a thing in, in the culture of mainstream media, at, at least. I, I mean, I, I sort of feel like that is that's almost like the branding of uh, of like alternative media though isn't it right like like that's how a lot of small media outlets kind of make their name is like oh we're going to tell you the stuff that the mainstream media won't tell you yeah uh I think that is the, that that is how they make their name. I don't really think they're any better about it. I, I, I I'd, I'd be curious. I, I'd be curious to, to ask her though. Do you think that the alternate media is doing a better job? Because if so, then we can just let them. Then presumably they'll become better, and they can just o o overtake traditional media. Um, or if she would maybe say something like, you know, well, you know, it doesn't seem like the market is necessarily rewarding it. You know, maybe it's the case that the news media with the better values about being open wouldn't necessarily be the most popular. Um, so again, it requires some sort of uh, motion or if she would just say you know i i don't think alternate media is really that much better than mainstream media I, in my opinion i think they're much worse but 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 yeah I, i'd be curious what her response to that would be yeah but you know what like even if they're worse i think i think having both of them as a supplement to one another is probably better than having either one alone right yeah that that that, that, that totally could be the case
I want to shift the conversation to talk about schools. That's an issue that you've talked a lot about and an issue on which you see Republicans really voicing a lot of distrust in schools and education. But I, I want to put that in a little bit of broader context because that's not new. Contrary to what people may believe, the Department of Education was not birthed by George Washington. The Department of Education was established under the Carter administration. And since time immemorial, and that means 1980, there's been a lot of talk from Republicans about wanting to shut down the Department of Education. We've heard that again from Republican candidates. Governor Ron DeSantis said that this week. You've heard that from other candidates. But this isn't new. Since 1980, you saw that in 1995, there was a real effort to shut down the Department of Education. Why that distrust historically and why that distrust recently? Well, one, and this does not apply to the entire GOP primary voter Mm -hmm. population uh, because many of them are not ideological, but there is an ideological bent toward, I mean, I'm like very libertarian on some, on many things. And if I had my druthers would live in a world where there were far fewer federal agencies, just period, Mm -hmm. because I think if the federal government were less expansive and took fewer experts to run each individual thing, it might actually do things better. That's part of it. There is a distrust among center-right folks of orders coming from the federal government all the way down, and that that is, in the case of education especially, and I think you saw that some of this on the left with No Child Left Behind, that these, th- these things can't be tailored to schools that need to do different things, right? I have been open to that idea. I've, my mother was a teacher. I've seen it, right? So I think there's some of that. The new enthusiasm, passion, for the distrust of these institutions from school boards on up comes from extended closures during COVID. Now, I was sort of no. steeped in this because I was in an area that schools closed for more than a year, and the fight to get them open was pitched, to say the least. A lot of parents, not right-leaning parents, this is Northern Virginia, learned for the first time and were genuinely surprised. Even I was surprised as a skeptic of government in general that the school board was adversarial to many parents just asking for their kids to be in school. And the treatment was bad to the point of, like, one of my friends who was a, an activist on this being told that she just wanted her brunches back. She's, you, know, you saw this in various school boards that, hey, do you want your kid dead or do you want them educated? That was an actual school board member in Alexandria, Virginia, who said that is paraphrased, well, but it is not unfaithful to, to the spirit of that no. quote. And so a lot of people who were very invested in that fight, many of them not ideological, many of them not right-leaning, started noticing more things that their uh, school, was doing, or their school was doing. It really bothers me for, that she's saying not ideological, right? Like, this is one of those things where it, it seems like there's this, this bias that people have where it's like, oh, those other people are ideological, right? It's, it's like yeah. as, as if it's not the case that everyone is ideological in their own way. I think what I she's trying to say is that these are not an inherently right-wing people, that this is not just a right-winger thing, I think is what she's trying to say. Uh, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Not ideological in a way that aligns with the like left-right axis yeah. of American politics, but perhaps. <laughs> yeah, this is a this is a great story, but like I need evidence here. Like, um, my I, I I think it's a lot more clear why it is happening is because the number one issue right now on the right wing is trans is trans issues, and that has a ton to deal with in schools, and that's been like the primary focal point of it. Uh, and the CRT stuff. I mean, that's th- th- these are huge controversial issues. I don't think you need an explanation for why are these top issues. Like, it's very understandable. You know, I don't agree with the right wing, but I totally see why that's very controversial to the right wing. You know. Just Agrees with they, all, you they know, f- I, I, fear for the future of their children, and if the stuff that they believed about trans people were true, then it would make a lot of sense for to be afraid. Of yeah, 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 like, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah. I, I. I am super skeptical of the. I mean, maybe it's true, but I need to see some evidence that isn't my friend went to a school board and then like, come on, like, like I, I need something more than that for it to be the case that actually a lot of the groundwork for distrusting schools came from when the schools decided they should remain closed when parents thought they shouldn't. Mm-hmm. or got more angry at their schools for treating them the way but you that they know what though them like actually that, that kind of has to be true on some scale like like we can't really doubt that there that there must be 
like quite a lot of parents who wanted their kids back in school and 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 weren't able to because of the COVID closures, right? Like, I, like I'm yeah. That, that that that's one thing. It's another thing to then say that that then those same parents who otherwise would not have were concerned um, about uh, transgender uh, ideology in schools or CRT in schools. Mm -hmm. Oh, another thing you said a minute ago that I, that I wanted to like push back on a little bit is I don't actually think trans issues are the number one thing on the right wing. I, th I think the, the, the number one thing that they're actually like focused on right now is the Trump indictment and like the, the That's whole fair, yeah, it, uh, the, the, the Trump indictment stuff, I think, particularly in the last couple of months, has gotten a lot more intense. That's fair. Uh, but I, I think it's fair to say it's been one of the top issues like in the last year or so. Yeah. And, and also, like, like, is it really like getting more attention than than the Ukraine war or like the various accusations of corruption that they want to throw at the Biden administration. Like, I'm not sure it's actually like outshining any of those things. But I, uh, Well, I, uh, coverage of the Ukraine war is a different thing because for a long, long time, we're starting to see some movement on it now. But for the for, for the first solid year of the war in Ukraine, most Republicans are actually very supportive of Ukraine, like lot, like all, all the biggest establishment Republican candidates and the polling showed that that uh, your, your standard rank and file Republican voters supported Ukraine. So absolutely, the Ukraine war got more coverage. But in terms of issues that animated the right, I would still say that trans issues were and I think probably still are a lot more uh, important to uh, to the Repu to the right wing than um, Ukraine was absolutely uh yeah yeah that makes sense that makes sense them who had no opinion on say teachers unions before or had a vaguely positive vision of teachers unions got pretty upset with them particularly a place like virginia where teachers were put at the front of the line and then were then told everybody no no we're not going to go back they were put at the front of the line for vaccines the ask was let's get back in school the answer was no so this made people very upset. And I have been sort of mystified during this entire debate by the fact that many on the left believed that there would not be a large consequence for having closed a daily part of sort of given public facility. Did people really believe that there wouldn't be a large pay taxes consequence for that you know is going to be there and it might not be it's, perfect yeah it it, it's funny there. i seem to recall a lot of people on the right saying people know for making too big a deal of what the impact of COVID. it was it's just a flu bro it's not much worse than the seasonal average flu uh, uh yeah well I, I think i think what she's talking about is like the the educational Im impact of just like having kids not go to school for a long time right yeah yeah I, I agree there yeah yeah which i don't think anyone would have denied that there would be a significant impact of that it's just that they thought it was necessary for public safety but i mean ma you know maybe the people she talked to might have have, have been telling her that there's going to be no significant impact but it, that just seems like a really implausible thing for almost anyone to believe good in some cases, but the doors are going to open. And then the answer was, they're not going to open. You're fine. Shut your mouths. And that wasn't the truth. The kids weren't fine. Some of them did fine. I don't want to paint with a, too broad a brush. But of course, there was a loss of trust there. Of course, Democrats in some polls lost 20 points generational advantage on the issue of education. And they deserved to. Wait, I thought the was polling wasn't accurate. The COVID death toll in 2021 well, was I, higher I, than in 2020. I don't think she was saying so much that the polling wasn't accurate when she was referring to 2016. I think she was she was more oh, like I thought, talking. I thought she totally was. Uh, I think she, me. it sounded to me like she was talking about the way that it was reported, like the news coverage of it. And, and the, okay, maybe that, that, that might be my, that might be my bad then. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe she said a more specific thing about the polling that, that like went in one ear and out the other. Maybe I missed that, but yeah. It feels obvious in hindsight that schools should have been open. But again, the start of the 20th. Wait, what? Hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Is this, hold on. Is this the New York Times person or is this the conservative? It's the New York Times lost person. 20 points generational advantage on the I issue think, of education. It? And they yeah, deserve it. Uh, let's see. Because this was a disservice. The COVID death toll in 2021 was higher than in 2020. It feels obvious in hindsight that schools should have been open. But again, Why? the start of the 2020-2021 yeah, school year, at all we me. were not I mean, like... even remotely out of the woods. And especially uh, what we knew at the time is different. Does it feel like there was a, a good reason at all to keep school doors closed to you? Yes. Okay. 
so I will give you the end of 2020 school year. At that time, I was like, oh, gosh, this does seem weird. Maybe like maybe we should mm-hmm. take extreme measures. And we did not know yet how it affected children. Mm-hmm. I get that. So even with some shutdown. Oh, things, please tell me. Little... Please tell me they're not going to say kids don't die from it. Therefore, there's no impact of keeping schools open. I don't think she's going to say that. But... Those in my mind, right? So I thought, oh, well, this does seem like a once in a lifetime event mm-hmm. for a little while. But I think if you look back at the data and some of the reporting at the time, you will see, I believe it was an NPR report by Anya Kamenetz. I think it was a June report on kids of essential workers who were therefore exposed more than other kids were being taken care of at YMCAs and other facilities so that their parents could work. And the ways that they figured out to make that work and the early data from that, as we had seen from early data from Denmark or Sweden, was that, in fact, it wasn't passing from these kids to these caretakers, that it wasn't creating these huge outbreaks. And I think had there been, as there was in some red states, as there was among private schools, a bent toward the idea of opening as opposed to stuck on the closing, you would have modulated fairly quickly. You've written. OK, OK, that's a much better. Ar- I thought I thought it was going to be kids. Uh, but 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 it's actually it is actually an argument about how whether or not kids are a vector for spread. Um, I'd be interested to look into that because that's not my understanding. But but I, I could totally be off basis there. So but so I'll, I'll at least tip the hat there. That's yeah. a. This, uh, if if what she's saying is true, then then absolutely that would be a, a very strong argument. Th- this show I've noticed tends to be pretty good about like citing their sources in in the video description, so that might be oh, a thing that you, yeah, me, you might be able to look up. Yeah, let me see here. That students will need creative solutions to come back from this damage. They deserve better than power consolidated in the hands of those who failed them. Just to your point, looking forward, it's not. What ideas have you come across that are interesting to you? Yeah, so I do think that in many cases, workplaces and schools is another area, we have earned flexibility from this terrible situation that COVID gave us. And that in some cases, flexibility can give you the creative solutions. Often, parents created those for themselves with pods or with homeschooling. There's data all over the place that homeschooling has gone up exponentially, particularly in minority communities Mm -hmm. who adopted it. And so I think ways to give them resources. Virginia is a place where there's now a credit to pay for the intensive tutoring that your kid might need after the the schools Mm -hmm. were closed for so long. I think those are ways that we can help. I'm not averse to spending on that, especially when COVID spending has already gone out the door and exists. But frankly, there's not a lot of, there's not a magic bullet, I think is my concern. And that we are so behind the ball that it gets pretty daunting. One of the challenges you face in school curriculum in general, whether it's about closures or whether it's about arguments over what children are taught when, is that this will always be hinged on the most motivated people getting involved. But you also need to consider the interests of all children, including the children who have parents who aren't involved at all. You mentioned um, increasing numbers of people homeschooling. There's been a lot of talk about the rise of charter schools um, and advocacy for private school vouchers. You've seen that system in a bunch of states. But again, those systems often will leave behind students who are already always left behind. Students who aren't able to navigate applying for charter schools or private schools themselves. Students who might be in foster care. My concern is always that when you are relying on parents being super motivated, you know that there is a swath of people who are parents in legal terms, but may not be involved in their children's lives much at all. The point of having a public entity like the Department of Education and like the concept of public education in general is that you care about the kids when even their own parents don't. If you have any experience or have worked with kids who are in the juvenile justice system or in foster care or children who have suffered abuse and often neglect for whom school is where they will get fed 
School is where someone will notice if they are there. School is where someone will see that you have bruises or, you know, you are wearing the same clothes for days and days and days. And these are all things that happen to kids who are in the system and out of the system. I really worry about how a focus on an increasing privatization of schooling that, again, is driven by parents who care a lot about their kids and understandably are more concerned about their kids than the kids of just some dude. I get that. I totally do. But how do you think about this problem of the kids who who are already getting left behind? How do we make sure they aren't more so? Is that even possible? Okay, so the idea is that a public entity and a public school system cares about everyone's kids, even the kids that their own parents aren't caring about them, the people who the rest of society doesn't see and doesn't take care of. We tested that notion. In many cases, it wasn't true. It was not true. They had a year to show that it was true. 18 months in some cases. That is you seen COVID? such a giant failure of that concept that understandably people wonder, why am I dealing with you? Why are you? Wait. Is this, I wonder if this is something that, that's cited in the, you know, in the description, right? Because it's like... Um, no, like, the, 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 the only thing that's cited in the description is like some of the polling they had at the beginning. Um, okay. And a couple of... Uh, a couple... Uh, the, and then there's two articles, one about RFK and one about... Um, I'm not actually even sure what the second one's about. Um, okay, well then I guess citation needed, you know? Yeah, um, well, well I, I think she's referencing the fact that they remained closed. Um, that's, <laughs> that's not an argument. So, so we are to believe that because many schools chose to remain closed for a year plus during COVID, that actually they don't care about kids at all. And they provide no benefit to kids um, compared to if all of those kids were homeschooled. That's just not true. That's just not true. Okay, maybe, I, like, I, I might have been misunderstanding what she was saying then, because when she said this thing about, like, we tested that and we saw that it wasn't true, like, I guess what you're, the way you're interpreting it is, like, the COVID epidemic itself was the test. Yeah, I, 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 I okay. think that's what she's referencing. Yeah, I don't think she's referencing a study. Oh, okay. I thought she was referencing a study. It, it, okay, never mind. Like, that's why I was asking about a citation to the entity that we're asking to care about these kids when you actively did not. So I think we first have to acknowledge that when rubber hit the road, many public schools were not there. And then when many parents, myself included, argued that they should be there for that exact reason, they Jesus, called us a bunch of names. Jesus Christ. Up mm -hmm. to and including racists or wine moms or yoga moms or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. That that advocacy was not something that was real when many of them were arguing yes on behalf of their kids but on behalf of other kids too i don't think it's the right answer for everyone to abandon public schools so i don't want as a society to abandon this infrastructure that is here that does have these resources in many cases a lot of resources because the covid money mm -hmm. came in and much of it has not been spent i would like that to be spent on like i don't know not maybe major new admin expenses but actual student stuff. I think that's a place where you can advocate for good behavior in your school board to actually focus it on the kids. So there are things to be done, but I think it argues for parent involvement from those who are deeply concerned and who have the bandwidth sometimes to argue for other kids. You know, because that's what teachers are doing too. The good teachers are advocating not for their own kids. They're advocating for many kids, right? So that's, that's a thing you can do even while being a concerned parent. What would you change about the public school system to address some of those dynamics? The dynamics that you see between parents and teachers unions, where parents are getting called wine mom and teachers are getting called grooming right. Nazis. There's an impasse here that forgets that some parents are teachers and some teachers are parents. And they're all people who generally care about kids, I assume. What would you change about well, the other person just disagreed. one and <laughs> that impasse of some sort and to get us to a I'm better not, I'm not sure she did explicitly I think... disagree with that. I, 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 well, okay, maybe not maybe not on an individual level, but she definitely disagreed with the idea. I mean, she literally said we have to acknowledge that when the rubber hit the road, many public schools were not there. Um, or, and disagreeing with the idea that they 
you know, I'm sure she wouldn't say that individual teachers are bad people or anything like that, but I do think she is disagreeing with whether or not, you know, schools do care for students. Yeah, yeah well, because she, she was responding to this argument that, that, um, that the schools are supposed to be there to, for the children even when the parents are not. And she was saying, like, well, the, the institutions mm -hmm. failed yeah, to yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah, that's fair. I, I, I assume she would not say, um, she, she would not have such a negative opinion about the actual attitudes of, of individual teachers. Yeah, it would be shocking to me if she does. The problem that plagues this conversation is the one that plagues all American conversations, which is, you know, one of the things that when I speak on college campuses, and I'll speak often with my co-author guy, is that we'll challenge students if they want to know how to be more supportive of free speech or to even engage with the notion that it's like good, which many of them reject, maybe do a book trade, even if it's just a piece, right? Mm -hmm. Let's keep it low barrier of entry. Talk to each other for 20 minutes, set a timer, without either one of you questioning the motives of the other person. When I tell college students that, they're like, hmm, could I do that? <laughs> and it, it, it can be tricky. <laughs> but it sad. used to be something that I do feel we're better at. And I do think there used to be a general understanding that allowing lots of ideas to flourish and battle each other in the public square was a societal good. I disagree. You don't, you don't think we used to believe that? No, we did not. I, I th okay. Am I crazy or did she say, how do we solve the impasse between parents and teacher unions? And she said, the problem is, and this is a problem that's in lots of our societies, and then talked about how, you know, high, uh, uh, college students can't talk to people they disagree with. So I, I, I assume the problem she's talking about is we can't have difficult conversations anymore. Yeah, I think but, what but, she uh, means is like uh, people are broadly so suspicious of each other's motives that, that, that it's getting in the way of like all kinds of, you know, public discourse. Okay, but but this particular problem is that we are at an impasse in the public discourse. When teacher unions right. talk to the talk to teachers, they disagree and they call each other names. Yeah, so, so I think it, she's it, she's it, kind it, of it, trying to like diagnose like the nature of the problem when she says this. I think. Okay, um, uh, I, she hasn't I can yet see that. offered I can see a solution, that. but I, okay, I, okay, okay, that's fair. That's she, fair. I, I, I think I, she's I, just pointing I, I out like, like that this this is a problem that exists not just between parents and teachers, but between many factions of our society that we do, we mistrust each other so often that you know. Okay. Yeah. I think that with the "let many flowers bloom" idea, only certain flowers were permitted to bloom right. within a specific. You know, it's like when people talk about like, oh, you know, Congress used to work better because Democrats and Republicans all gathered. And I'm like, yeah, they were basically the same person. I do think that that era what? of like working together, I mean, it to me, so based stupid. on my understanding of events taking place before like 1970, is that, yes, people were getting along in some ways because certain people were permitted to be in positions of power and they all generally kind of knew and liked each other. Well, I guess maybe Wait, I can read no, 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 no. We that, have to like stop. Understand. That. Like, uh, like she, she really there just said, like in American friend. politics before 1970, people generally like knew and liked each other. It's like, okay, what was happening like right before 1970? It was like, I don't know. Like, like a shit ton of turmoil over all the like the. Nah, so what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious. When was the Vietnam War again exactly? When, I'm, I'm just, I'm having a little bit of trouble. When was the Vietnam War? That. When was segregation and the whole like Jim Crow era? Like you the know. Weatherman movement underground, you know, no, no, no biggie, no big deal. W Watergate. Oh, wow. Well, that was after um, 1970, but still. Yeah. Not, not too long, not too long. I, I, I believe she said 70s, I thought is what she said. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I could be misremembering that. It's, it's um, like 73, 74 ish. Um, yeah, wow, that's really a foolish thing to say, uh, respectfully. Um, there were obviously huge differences. There was a thing called the post-war consensus that did exist, and, you know, Ronald Reagan is very noteworthy. One of the big reasons why he's very, very known as president is because he was the first he was the first significant departure from that post-war consensus. You know, neoliberalism, a new form of liberalism was, you know, Reagan and Thatcher were considered to be, you know, the people who brought that in and in a way sort of invented that. Um, but like to it's one thing to say there was a that, you know, there was a certain ideological uh, assumption that was shared by both sides, you know, and then it wasn't shared. I mean, that is still true. And, you know, there are certain shared ideological assumptions in America today. And if in five 
five years from now, we suddenly diverge from one of those political assumptions, then yeah, it would be noteworthy. Oh, we used to all agree on that. But, 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 but that example would also demonstrate, you know, let's say five years from now, people no longer agree whether or not Hawaii should be a U.S. state. Right. In, 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 in five years from now, Democrats say, you know what, Hawaii shouldn't be a U.S. state. You could definitely say, oh, well, back in the day, it used to be a shared. Uh, everyone used to agree. Hawaii should be a U.S. state. But you wouldn't stay back in the day. Everyone agreed on everything, because very clearly right now we don't agree on everything. It's the same thing. We used to agree on certain things before the 70s. There was a thing called the post-war consensus, but we didn't agree on everything. There were still huge points of disagreement. The Vietnam War. I mean, oh, yeah. Anyways, I, I mean, I, I think what she's probably trying to get at is is that maybe there used to be a broader consensus about the value of like um free speech and public disagreement and and like perhaps that's true but i mean obviously like well, this the, is the, the new york times person so i don't even think she's like on the on the bent of like oh we used to have freedom of speech uh, yeah i don't i don't know it's it's just like I, the the time period she's pointing at just seems like like one of the worst examples. It's one of, one of the most, one of the most contentious periods in like American politics, contemporary politics. Like, right. Uh, okay. All right. Ending of cultural elites, mm -hmm. even ten years ago, was sort of default that free speech served society. Okay. Oh, no, that you're right. Flourishing of viewpoints, that having raucous debates. Now, they maybe didn't live that in their lives. And I agree with you that at times, obviously, different viewpoints are allowed to flourish and not others. So I think we have lost a cultural understanding there that I try to bring to the table. So that's why that conversation is bad. Mm -hmm. I do not know how to make it better, aside from the tiny, small work that I do in my daily life to have this conversation, to mm -hmm. have conversations online where I'm not calling people names, where I'm attempting to engage with their actual ideas. Look, sometimes do I think they're full of it? Yes. And sometimes I'll say that, but I just think this is the same thing plaguing this conversation as it's plaguing everything else. People question, go immediately to questioning motives. And then it turns into this toxic thing. And by the way, I don't think you were just doing that. Then you'll discover at times, maybe the motive should have been questioned. And that's, that's sort of <gasps> making it even more toxic. It's very, very tough work. I agree with you. With, it wasn't some like heyday when we were all great at talking to each other, but I do think there was less incentive to find the disagreement with your neighbor instead of say, hey, we both root for the same team. Let's talk about that. It's like, we got to find the other thing. And then once we find the other thing that we disagree on, I must eliminate you from my life as opposed to engaging with that idea. That's I can't super break fair. bread with you because you are now in this group. Mm -hmm. Let me offer an olive branch. That's very true. And the thing she said just before that, before she said, you know, the problem is we are always going after our motives. Now, sometimes you have to go after the motives. Before she said that, she, she had another great point talking about we need more uh, support for freedom of speech in our culture. I super agree. I don't know how I personally do that, but I'm trying. That's a super fair answer. That's a super totally fair. It's like, you know what? I don't have this. Pro I don't have the solution, but I know this is a problem. That's totally fair. And I thought it was a very honest uh, and, and very good answer shows that that has increased and is not great for us putting up those kind of walls and i think those kind of walls exist between school boards and parents in many cases I want to close out by talking a little bit about 2024. Republicans have an abundance of choice, arguably too much choice mm -hmm. in the GOP primary. What do you think we're oh, ultimately choosing? I thought she was just talking about all oh, the internet's so great because we've got all these primaries. Okay, okay. Between. <laughs> what they're actually choosing between is the chance to win a national election mm -hmm. and the chance to lose one dramatically. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that Trump for sure would lose no, no, not they, at all but look he's very vulnerable where, hmm, where have i heard this analysis before that Democrats this very person was criticizing that every indictment is an indictment bump mm -hmm. but only in the primary it's mm -hmm. not like you're winning suburban moms with your indictment bumps which is what you need mm -hmm. to do this and the thing that i put to many trump voters is how's he going to do it differently what's the plan like i don't want to argue with you about 2020 but he's not the president. So what does he...
Hey, I understand you don't want to argue with them in 2020, but you need to argue with them in 2020. Because if you don't agree on 2020, you know what they're going to say? We know what we're going to do differently. We're not going to let them steal the election because that's what happened in 2020. They stole the election. We're just not going to. We what? Well, we don't need to do anything differently to win. We need to do things differently to prevent the pro, you know to pro, to secure election integrity. So you can see how not arguing about 2020. Like I'm sorry, but like there are certain a house divided cannot stand on certain issues. There needs to be an agreement, right? Similar to how you have been talking about this thing. We need to have a shared understanding about the value of freedom of speech. I agree. You know what we also need to have a shared understanding of? Whether or not elections are, are, are can be trusted in our country. That's like one of the most important things for us to be able to trust in. Uh, yeah, so someone needs to make that argument to those people. It doesn't necessarily mean she's the right person to do it, and this yes, is the yes, right that's time fair. and place, that's fair. right? That's fair. All, all, yes, that's fair. Although, man, I kind of feel like, man, if not people like her, if, if, if not the reasonable conservatives, who? Like, if Ben Shapiro and this woman are not going to be the people that, like, walk the rest of the Republican Party back from the abyss, it's not going to be us, bro. I'm going to be honest. Like, as much as I would love for, you know, me and Cricket here to, to charge it and people <laughs> of our political ilk, it's not happening, okay? I I would I wish it could, but it's not going to happen. Well, it's got it's got to be someone who, who can have their trust, right? And that's not us, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it's like, not, not, not necessarily criticize this woman, but it's like, Republicans, the reason why Republicans in the room need to, like, be doing something. Although, I'm also very sympathetic to the argument, it's like, they really can't do anything. Because, like, even the reason the Republicans, the second they say anything, you know, it's funny, I mentioned Ben Shapiro. All the Trumpers hate Ben Shapiro. They're all like, Ben Shapiro, he was a never-Trumper in 2016, we can't trust him, blah, 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 blah. So, I don't know, I don't know, but you need to try. And his answer is nothing. His answer is nothing. He thinks that he's uh, beloved in Nevada. Suburban moms, not a problem. Mm -hmm. Not a problem at all. He doesn't need to win them. He doesn't need to do anything with independence. He doesn't need to uh, win the collar counties of Philadelphia. He doesn't need to change his message in Arizona. And to them, I say, look, if you're losing in Arizona and Georgia, you lost a long time ago. OK, and you got to make a plan to do something different. Now, I would say every other candidate does have some thoughts about how one would run differently than 2020. And that is, I know the bar's on the floor, y'all, but that is how you pitch winning in 2024. Now, I'm not the voice of the GOP electorate mm -hmm. very clearly. OK, I try to respect that and you I don't try to listen mm -hmm. to people. But I do think he's just sort of foregoing the idea of even thinking about how he could change anything to mm -hmm. win the presidency. So I think if you're interested in winning the presidency under this banner, then you need to think about that. I think that there's a book to be written that's like yeah, Trump, Donald not, Trump's not the most introspective and self-critical guy. God, I cannot, I, oh God, I cannot wait for people like this, for, for Trump to win the nomination and to run this party in the ground while people like this are just sitting there pouting. Oh, I can't, I can't I cannot wait. Oh, this is going to be a great. I mean, I mean, I say that actually. I mean, I don't I actually don't think it's a it's a guarantee that Trump is going to lose. Certainly he has probably worse chance than every other candidate. Um, but I actually don't think it's the cat. It seems like a lot of people are just assuming that Trump's going to auto lose. Trump only lost by, you know, a handful of votes, you know, in a, in a couple states, you know, just by virtue of the fact that, you know, vote out, vote, voter turnout is what it is. Um, I actually don't think it's it's guaranteed that uh, Trump lose if he got nominated so well, yeah. as, much as, as much as i say that um i i totally think it still is winnable for trump certainly less winnable than it would for another candidate but still winnable yeah i mean sometimes it can happen that that you win it any election just because the opponent loses it right <laughs> like you're like yeah. if, the, if the democrats fuck up badly enough then oh uh, yeah 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 i'd having just perpetual confidence in yourself like it's almost inspiring concerning but inspiring and it's spanned his career, yes. right? Any any loss is not a loss. Right. Any bankruptcy is not really a bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. Any loss of money is not really a loss of money. Mm -hmm. Why are the losses really losses? I'm so really curious. Mm -hmm. And often it works. I don't know how to solve that problem. No, and it's just like the problem she's talking about is like, now obviously the Republican base doesn't agree with me. Why? Why would they not agree with you? Oh, 
I wonder what kind of media they're consuming. I wonder if there are systemic problems with that media. Kind of like the systemic problems you're alleging in other forms of media. Would you like to talk about that? Would you like to comment on that? No, no, agree to disagree. Agree to disagree and move. Well, she <laughs> hasn't said no to that, right? Like, I, like, and I suspect she'd probably agree with you that there are systemic problems in right-wing media. It would be, it would, it would be I, great if she was as full-throated about those criticisms as she was about other instead of as she is about the criticisms of mainstream media. Okay, well, she might be elsewhere. I don't want to assume what her opinion is or isn't on that, you know? I don't know. Maybe this is just my style of conversation, which is totally fair. For me, if I was in a conversation and this came up, I would I, I, I would not brush over it. I, w- I would explicitly say, I have this problem. Maybe that's just my style of conversation. But, like, to me, for, to me, this definitely feels like her brushing over it. To be like, well, they think that, you know, they don't need to change anything. And I disagree with them on that. But, you know, whatever and move on. Not mentioning the fact that, you know, you know, a, a particular conversation about institutions and trust, you know, the fact that they're trusting in these institutions of the alternate media. To me, that feels like totally brushing over. But maybe maybe that's just how my brain parses conversations. And it is totally normal for her or or. or or, or not just for her, but I'm the odd one out for for other people to do that. That that could be the case. Yeah, but, I mean, oh, I, I don't it still think, really gets to it. I don't think the analysis of what you're saying is wrong. It's it's just more like um, I I don't know. I, I it's not necessarily that she needs to to focus on that, right? And she she has generally, you know, a lot of the things she's saying have been indictments of the media pretty broadly. Without it's it's not like she's specifically saying the left wing media has a problem. Well, right? I feel like she is specifically saying the mainstream media. I think I think she is she is 100 percent doing that. Yeah. I, I I think the criticism she's been making have been squarely planted at CNN and Fox News and MSNBC and not the Daily Wire, Tim Pool, yeah, etc. Yeah, yeah. Well, Fox News I think is part of the apparatus that you're talking about. That's right? okay. That's fair. That's fair. Well, the, the the candidates that will hopefully be on stage with him in a debate if he shows up mm-hmm. have a they weird didn't. spoiler alert needle to thread. <laughs> right. You have to speak to Trump voters. You cannot just abandon them or tell them they're all terrible or be too critical of Trump. If you're a Chris Christie, I don't think you're earning a lot of those votes. Although I will say a forceful, good speaker can make headway in a way that Christie has by just kind of being bold and confident. And mm-hmm. he has done that. I would say the argument against his candidacy is that he's like, I'm going to take Trump down. It's like, well, uh, you had a chance to do that before mm-hmm. and you didn't. All of them have to walk this weird line where they don't attack him too much, but they find the right way to attack him. Mm-hmm. And if they attack him too much, that's actually a bump for him. And if he gets bad news, that's actually a bump for him also. <laughs> and people don't want to hear about policy. They want to hear about the fights you're having. But if you have to talk about the fights you're having, the independents and the suburban moms are going to hate you. It is not easy, but it's not designed to be easy. Mm-hmm. And it is a puzzle. And I think... To me, the simple message is, are you winning with this guy? Are you winning so much that you're tired of winning? Because it doesn't feel like I'm tired of winning right now. I can win. I can get results. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. He was the president. In some places, for conservatives, he got results. And many of the things he most complains about, he didn't. Mm -hmm. So you say, he was there for four years. He had his chance. He didn't do it. I can do it. Here's how I'm going to do it. You've talked about how Governor Ron DeSantis has the power to combine populism with oh yeah she's 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 of course she's a DeSantis shell so I I should say shell of course she's on the DeSantis train now this is like on paper he is the obvious choice that Trump voters could like him he has not turned them off in any major way he has a bit of the he fights vibe that's one of the things I think. I really like Tim Scott, and I think he has a talent for A, fundraising, B, speaking and making a moment for himself. He's very good at sort of getting that the flare up of like, oh, this is his moment, and he makes people feel good about America. He is a happy warrior. I am not convinced the electorate is looking for a happy warrior. I think they're looking for a warrior. Happy to be disproven because I like to be a happy warrior myself. But I think DeSantis has more of that I am a fighter versus a happy warrior which is something that people like from Trump and want from Trump. I think that he has a real distinguishing moment, which is the COVID moment. Now, a lot of Trump supporters will very swiftly start defending every lockdown policy or every policy choice that Donald Trump made and sort of throw out the window all their tweets from 2020 that were upset about these things. I think DeSantis has a record that he can say, again, I don't know whether the electorate is in for this, 
But I think there's a very obvious point to be made, which is, look, knock on me is like, I'm, I'm really into the numbers. I, I'm too into the numbers, not enough glad handing, whatever. I look at the numbers because I care about getting policy right. And I looked at the numbers very deeply in 2020. And I got this call right in a lot of ways where he got it wrong. And we would have been in a different place. Particularly the schools being open is a win for him. I think just a clean win. And Trump supporters will say, well, he said that schools should go back. And it's like, true, I will defend him on that. He did say that in summer 2020, that they should work on it. Did he have a plan for making that happen? No. And that's where you get to the, the difference between the two. So I think, to my mind, the lockdowns of 2020 and the school shutdowns, one of the major civil liberty battles of our time, where it's just like this vast, very quickly decided, almost no process. You can't go to restaurants and you can't go to church. That's a big deal. And a lot of people want to treat it like it's not a big deal. And maybe I'm the outlier. But I do think there's an argument to be made for his. And yes, it was I think it was partially ideological that his tendency was to value as much freedom as possible to do those everyday things and valuing the economy. Yes. While also attempting to protect people. And I think the preservation of freedom itself Wait, was valuable. While also attempting to protect people. It seemed like he wanted to promote those things at the expense of protecting people, right? He, he prioritized it over protecting people. I think that's an argument he can make. I wonder how many GOP voters care about it once Trump is on the stage fighting against it. I don't know. Oh, you know, you know how you would maybe answer the question of how are they going to how many of them are going to care about it? You would look at their motivations. You would look at, well, what is animating them to think in this particular way? You know, you, uh, I, I, it's, it's, it's very frustrating because I feel like she will make these criticisms like, oh, you know, you can't write off Trump voters. You can't just look at people's motivations. And then she'll say these things like, well, why don't they like DeSantis? I'll tell you why. Because of their motivations, because of where they're getting their news from. Oh, it is just like. And because of their loyalty to Trump, who's bad mouthing. Yeah. Him. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it is all the things that the, the the people you've been criticizing have been talking about, and all the things that you refuse to look at. Like I, it. Obviously, I don't actually. I, I don't like Trump. I don't support Trump. You know, Trump versus Sanders is. I, I don't, I'm not sure which is worse. But like, and, and, and the future is uncertain. But if it is the case that Trump wins the nomination and Sanders completely implodes. As it currently looks like, that is what's going to happen. If current trends hold, which they won't necessarily will, it is. I just cannot wait. I just cannot wait for Ben Shapiro and all these monitors to be like, what happened? Oh, ho, ho. What happened is your people went crazy. You couldn't keep your house in order. And this is the consequence. And you have dug your own grave. And I cannot wait for you to go sit in it. Yeah, because <laughs> oh, And it's just like, it is just so frustrating that these people, it's like, from where I'm sitting, the left, we fight a lot with ourselves, sometimes to our detriment. But you know what you can't say? You can't say people like Destiny or, you know, people or, 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 or you know, uh, online Twitter lefties carry water for the bad people on their side. They don't do that. They love to tear each other apart. And I think it is part of the reason why, you know, we seem to be a little more at this particular time in history resistant to this kind of stuff happening for us. And when the people on the right refuse to do the same and are always putting their blinders on to, I think, a lot of the bad conduct on their side, you know, where like Ben Shapiro says, sure, the Trump indictments are, are bad, but let's talk about Hillary Clinton's email server. When you put those blinders on, you are enabling this kind of stuff. And when the chickens come home to roost and, you know, the person you recognize is really bad, Trump, wins the nomination and you have to follow, follow, follow him as he leads your party to oblivion in another, another election, which isn't actually guaranteed, but it's certainly very likely to happen based on current evidence. Like, you have no one to blame but yourself. Like, you are digging your own grave here. Yeah, I think I, the, one, the one thing that I think you said that's like a little bit contentious was that people on the left don't like carry water for the bad people on, on their side. But the thing is, people on the left disagree a lot about who the bad people are on their side, right? And, and so, like, it, you know, if, if, if you're going around uh, ar arguing in favor of like Joe Biden, well, there's a lot of people on the left who think Joe Biden is one of the bad people on our side because, you know, it, 
Yes, but 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 I feel like that's the point. The point is when Ben Shapiro doesn't like Trump, he likes DeSantis. But I think Ben Shapiro is coy about how bad Trump is and doesn't lay into Trump as much as you know he otherwise would because Trump is so popular in the Republican Party. I don't think that's the case with people on the left, and that's why I think they're a lot more you know, or I I, I think it contributes to why they're a lot I, more resilient right now. Like, I feel I, like, like the easier example is Tucker Carlson, who had his texts leaked, and you know what I mean, yeah, like. Yeah. A, yeah, it, who, who, I, I, I mean that too. With, with, with Carlson, I think Carlson is, you know, I think Carlson lies about, you know, what he thinks, particular motivations. But he isn't that far from from his actual positions. Like Carlson still wants Trump. It's just, you know, he's not going to be public about Trump as an idiot. But Trudeau doesn't like Trump, and he'll say, I, I, I support DeSantis over Trump. But he'll still carry water for Trump in arguments that I think he knows Trump is wrong. I think I think he's aware that Trump is completely fucked in these indictments deservedly so, but we'll still be like, well, blah, something, something, Hunter Biden, something, something, Hillary Clinton emails. You know, Joe Biden had documents. Why isn't he being treated the same? I, th- I, I, I think Ben Shapiro is a lot more explicit about, like, carrying water for something he doesn't support. And then when the thing he carried water for be- is successful, he's like, oh, how could this happen? It's like, bro, you, well, it's you are how it could happen. I, I think his loyalty is to the conservative movement writ large, right? And and so yeah, well, sometimes you gotta give him some tough love. Sometimes you gotta give him some tough love, man. Or or, or this is what happens. Or or you get a spoiled child like the GOP base, who when they lose, blame everything but themselves and refuse to refuse to get better. Well, yeah, I mean, like that's <laughs> Trump is a spoiled child in almost almost every sense of the word True. that a seventy that a something man can be, right? But and and so I. I I feel like Ben Shapiro would would agree with a, like a, and well yeah in fact we know he does agree with a lot of the left's criticisms of of Trump and but it's just like it's like why does he argue for him I, I don't think it's it's be, well, like okay I'm trying to think how do I put this I, I don't I don't want to like you know lay at his feet the success of Trump as if as if like he's no, yeah, primarily I mean, he, to, to then he's blame. only one small part yeah, and, and and like I guess you could say like maybe he's insufficiently op- opposed him or whatever, but but you know even the the extent to which he has opposed him has has cost him you know the the ear of of quite a lot of other you know people on the right. So I, mean, I I agree, and I'm very sympathetic, but like at a certain point, it's like. If you are going to do this, you don't get to complain anymore. You don't get to be like, oh, gosh, you know, guys, shouldn't we support DeSantis? Like, I don't like the play. What I I don't appreciate is I don't appreciate Ben Shapiro trying to, like, have his cake and eat it, too. Where he's like, he knows Trump is in the wrong. He makes these arguments, but he carries water for him. And then, you know, is frustrated with his party going with Trump. That's the thing that that I think really gets to me. Um, Yes, Ben Shapiro would not be able to, you know, move the needle on Hunt all on his own. But it's... It's like, you know, it, 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 it's like voting. Like, yes, if you, you – your single vote is not going to be enough to change it. But if you aren't even willing to do that, you don't uh, you don't have, like, really a leg to stand on in order to, like, complain massively, I think. Yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like there's two different things getting confused here where he's like – he'll make pro-Trump arguments and you're saying, like, then he can't complain that, like, tr- Trump is the person who's, who's, like, the standard bearer for his party – but he doesn't. He doesn't make those kind of Trump pro-Trump arguments, right? He doesn't want Trump to be the standard bearer for for his party. We all know that. He says it publicly, right? So yeah, I, I, I think the distinction is it's not when he makes pro-Trump arguments because there are some things, you know. Sometimes I make pro-Trump arguments. You know, if you find a sufficiently deranged person who thinks, you know, Donald Trump is literally Hitler, you know, even I will make pro-Trump arguments. It's not just defending Trump. Mm-hmm. I think it is carrying water for Trump when he knows better. I think there are times Ben Shapiro knows better that Trump is in the wrong here, that he could come down much harder on Trump and be justified, but but knowingly chooses to do the to, to not do that, to, to, to try and placate the base, to try and play nice with them. Um to to preserve the what whatever influence he has over them to to be able to to steer the ship in whatever way he can right like, yes i i hear you this used to be my exact thought process <laughs> as well um and and you know what 
there still could be a, you know, I, I could be wrong here. I, I I could be wrong that it's better for him to be on the, right? It's, it's like the classic, you know, incremental reform versus, you know, staying out there, you know, there, you know, does he, does he be, be Chris Christie and totally, you know, uh, 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 you know, divorce himself from the Trumpers in order to make a stand, but then have zero influence. I'm sympathetic to that conflict. Like, how do you balance that? But at a certain point, I feel like, uh, at least by my estimation, he's way too far from the other end. If Chris Christie is like is like the example of of going way too far, I think Ben Shapiro is actually the opposite. He's the guy where he's like, "Do you like Trump? No, no, I don't think Trump should be you know should 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 be our our, our guy." Um, when do you criticize Trump? Oh well, sometimes I like to say that Trump might have a statistically lower chance than maybe being better. Like I think the sycophantism for Trump on behalf of Ben Shapiro is way too high. I'd like to see him move in that direction. Okay, but then when he does it, you're criticizing him for wanting to have his cake and eat it too, right? So it's so it's like well, uh, I, I, I suppose but, then there's a degree of having your cake and eat it too. I, I I understand that there has to be a balance. Like I'm not expecting you know Ben Shapiro to walk out and become like you know a 24/7 anti-Trumper, but like I think yeah. he could be doing a lot better than what he's doing now. And 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 here's the real thing. I think he is. I think if he struck the correct balance. The way that the the way the, the way that you know that the balance would be correct would be the results would be you know and obviously Benjamin can't know this but omnisciently we would if we knew oh this is the best way to move the Republican base away from Trump well then he wouldn't be having his cake and eating it too because the base would be moving away from Trump but I think the base is not moving away from Trump a big part of that is because no one is piercing the conservative uh, 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 bu uh, echo chamber the conservative bubble and one of the people. In pro one of the most people in the most prime position to do that is Ben Shapiro. Like, I guess the question is, like, if Ben Shapiro isn't going to be the one to do it, then who is? I don't think, I, I can't think of almost anyone that is better positioned than Ben Shapiro or the people like Ben Shapiro that are still very much anti-Biden, they're strong conservatives, you know, they're not even necessarily super anti-populist, but they aren't pro-Trump. Yeah, well, my guess is he probably believes that no one has the power to do it, that, that it's not a thing that he can accomplish. And and but he still thinks Trump is like preferable to the Democrats and they're and therefore like that's the argument mm -hmm. he makes. Yeah, I, 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 I'm I sympathetic to that to, to that viewpoint. But I think that at a certain point you but I think there are, you know, I don't know if Ben Shapiro could, you know, make it so DeSantis could uh, could win the nomination, but I think there's a lot more that he could be doing. I think it could be much more effective at moving people away from Trump, and the fact that he isn't willing to do it makes me really hard for me to take him seriously when he complains about Trump being the head of the Republican Party. Okay, but, but well, the complaints are the part that you agree with that, though, right? So, well, yeah, so, I, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I agree with those complaints, but if someone making the complaints has has within their power the ability to do something about those complaints and they don't do them, it significantly cheapens them making the complaints. Yes, the complaints are still true, but like if you're saying like, oh my gosh, I hate pollution so much and like you are intentionally buying like the most like pollutant car because you think it looks nicer, like that does cheapen your criticism of pollution. Yeah, so, sort of. I mean, it's going to cheapen the, the credibility with which he's perceived in the conservative movement in, in a way, right? Like, it's like because he's like a little bit waffly about it, uh, he's not going to be perceived as taking a, a strong enough stand, you know, for one or the other, right? Um yeah, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I just think that there's a lot more that he could be doing, and it's disappointing that he isn't doing it. I, I could be wrong. It, it's a very difficult thing to know the exact balance, but like, I. For a long time, I was a lot more sympathetic to Ben Shapiro, and then I heard him talk about the Trump indictment stuff. And as someone who grad, and as someone who graduated Harvard Law, but you were a graduate of Harvard Law, he was just engaged in the most like erroneous legal defenses of all time. Just so you think he's just being dishonest about it then, or I, I, I. I, I I really don't like to do this, but yes, I for uh, no, normally I would never say this, but like he's just he, like just incorrectly citing the law. So in, in many of these cases, talking about like the need for in, the, the, uh, not mentioning the fact that you need to prove intent. Right. He talked about, you know, Hillary Clinton, you know, also had these documents. Well, Hillary Clinton, the FBI stated they were never able to find any evidence of her intent. And Ben Shapiro just never mentions the fact that the law under which Trump was being charged requires intent. Like th th there's a certain level of and, and, and here's the key thing. Ben Shapiro is not stupid. Ben Shapiro is very smart. And 
maybe he is, you know, you know, you know, maybe he's very overworked. You know, he's doing a lot of different stuff with Daily Wire. Maybe something slips in the cracks. He's in a difficult cracks. position. And, and, and I agree, he's in a difficult position. But like at a certain point, like I don't know, for a long time I agreed with that, and then I just kept seeing Ben Shapiro get worse and worse and worse and worse. And like at a certain point, I had to be like, the question to ask myself, I asked myself, is if this isn't enough for me to consider Ben Shapiro not doing enough, then what would be? Because I almost can't imagine it being any worse for carrying water. For Trump, as someone who's ostensibly an anti Trump Republican. Mm -hmm. A bunch of people, kind of center right people, expected that 2022 would be a red wave and mm -hmm. a bloodbath in part because of COVID policy. That there were a host of Democratic governors and Democratic leaders who had put forth very strict lockdown policies that they themselves may not even really abided by in a lot of states, and that they would get punished by the electorate for it. And that didn't happen. No, it was like, basically Virginia, Nevada, and like New Jersey was a close call. And yeah. that was I'm really curious what her yeah, explanation like, is going to be because she was making a lot of these Trump arguments Denver. just you like 30 minutes ago. Minnesota, you saw in Ohio, even with having Republican governor, people get very mad at him because of lockdown policies or his COVID policies. He's fine. Do we have a shorter memory for COVID than you thought we would? Absolutely. And this is one thing where I cop to caring deeply about this and therefore possibly overreading it. I didn't overread it in, in Virginia. That was one moment where I was like, I think this is all going to hinge on schools. And a couple of people were like, no, that's crazy. Nobody in Northern Virginia is voting for Yonkin over schools. And I was like, mm -hmm, OK, we'll see. So there are moments where that happened. There were not a lot of moments where that happened. I think you see it more in those numbers I was talking about mm -hmm. earlier, which is a big deal with Democrats losing a double digit generational lead on education, that kind of thing. Part of it, I think, is that it was a really, really hard time, particularly in the places that were most shut down. And people don't want to think about it. They want to move wow. on from that. And so I think that rehash. The places where COVID policy was the worst are going to be the least motivated to vote on it. That seems very. I, I don't understand where she's going with that. Yeah. It can come with trouble. And this is one of, I think, one of the challenges that DeSantis faces, <laughs> of course, as usual in the primary, no rules apply to Donald Trump, but they all apply to everyone else. So Donald Trump can talk about 2020 all day and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But talking about 2020 and 2021 and your actual policies on the ground in this very formidable Why can Trump country, do that, I wonder? Like, well, are we looking backward a little <laughs> too much? You know, so prosecuting that case is hard. And I, but I do think there's more appetite for it in a GOP primary electorate than there is in the general electorate. I think that part of why the conservative ecosystem is rooting for Ron DeSantis is that he is a conservative that they understand. He supported privatizing crazy. Social Security back in 2012. He was talking about how he really wanted to embrace then Representative Paul Ryan's policies back in 2012. A lot I think of them just want to move past to me, Trump. As someone who thinks a lot yes. about conservatism and has. Yeah, sorry, just to be clear, the actual answer is that a huge swath of the establishment hates Trump, has not liked him at any point. This is why yeah. lots of people who were by Trump's side during his administration, like Lindsey Graham, had all these clips, you know, where they would say, if we nominate Trump, we're going to lose and we'll deserve. It. And then our super chummy chummy with Trump, you know, what, what, you know, what, you know, they get taken out back and, and get shown the Trump polling numbers, you know, in their home state. And they're like, well, I guess I'm on board with this guy now. That's the reason they like DeSantis, because he's the most viable person to get them off of the Trump train. Yeah. Looked and watched conservatism for a very long time that Ron DeSantis is a conservative that conservatives get. You know, he's run Florida. Uh, no, the, the conservative that conservatives get is Trump because he's the one that's massively <laughs> popular. Let's just be clear about this. Yeah, but, he, but the a conservative that the that the establishment traditional yeah, conservative I, I, figures. Yeah, get. yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not quite sure if, they, if, if that's what they're saying, though. It feels like they're they're kind of have, have the cake and eat it, too. But or, uh, well, well, I should be so judgmental. Let, let me give them a chance to, to lay out their vision before I jump, jump down their throat. As a conservative? When he was in Congress, he was a conservative Republican. Donald Trump is not a conservative. People have said that repeatedly and expected people to be like, oh, well, in that case, I shall not vote for him. But that isn't what happened. He's done things that conservatives liked on judges or tax cuts, things like that. But there was really kind of a sense of like waving a carrot in front of him and being like, OK, here's the judicial nominations we would like. Now, please stop tweeting. And now. DeSantis trails Trump by close to 
30 percentage points in recent womp, polling. Womp. What I do you make that, of that even. gap and what, what that says about where the conservative ecosystem is right now? One thing I have to be careful of and one thing that I was not careful of in 2016 is forgetting that I am ideological. Mm hmm. No, nope. most people are not. And I ah. have to think about uh, that's as I not say, true that most people are that's their <laughs> political crowd. That's their motivations, it's by the way. You're speaking to their motivations. The normies who you have to earn mm -hmm. their votes. One of the things you want to do is just keep in mind that you are like a giant days of our lives wrestling fan, whatever it is, that in your mind, like everything that happens every single day is deeply important to the country and to the storyline, and you must tune in every day. And your friend who doesn't watch Days of Our Lives or wrestling is like, mm -hmm. I don't know, I feel like if I tune in four years from now, Hope and Bo will be kind of like doing the same thing mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll just check in then. So you have to adjust for that. And many people don't. And many people in GOP leadership don't. One of the things that struck me about 2016 is I think it was true. that There were, there were many good messengers for conservatism for this slate of issues mm -hmm. and ideas on that stage who were not Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they were good messengers for that message means the message was rejected mm -hmm. they wanted a new suite of things to talk about and so to my mind many of those who are critical of trump as i am but many of those who are very critical of trump don't deal with that reality of the gop electorate that their desires were not being met by this other slate of issues i think you're right desantis is a more movement conservative mm -hmm. style so there is that but i think again he gives a fighter vibe but yes, I think you're largely right. One of the reasons conservatives have turned to him is I think he has a record. He raises money. That big win for mm -hmm. him in his reelect is a huge part of this puzzle as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, the proof's in the pudding. And I think that's one of the early answers to Trump that was effective was he was kind of was just like, look at the scoreboard, man. Like, I appreciate you being my constituent. But like, <laughs> yes, well, the scoreboard it? now is not that's looking too hot for him. DeSantis is not just very conservative. He is also performing being very conservative in a way that I find extraordinarily off-putting on a personal level. His campaign made that ad that basically celebrated the anger of LGBT people and attacked Donald Trump for saying he'd protect LGBTQ people from terrorism. That's literally to me, I'm like, absolutely not. I would sooner set myself on fire than support him. I get that there's the political impulse to promise pizza for everyone, and you can't do it. But also, do not turn off, like, a large swath of Americans, especially when you're going to need to turn them back on later. Yes. Okay, so I think some of this is a play for Iowa yes. specifically. I get obviously, that. Where Kim Reynolds enjoys 50-plus percent approval and Despite also— she was so nasty to Mr. Trump. And actually, oh, Iowans responded badly to that. Yes, they uh, many did. <laughs> of them, many of them gave an answer that said, uh, no, thank you to that. I think it was 70 plus percent disapproved yeah. of that attack on her. Yeah. Also, she signed a six week mm -hmm. abortion ban. There are other examples of Kemp in Georgia, DeWine in Ohio, mm -hmm. winning by huge margins and having done that because it's something that they believe in. Right. So on that issue in particular, I think he looks to those numbers and says, look, this is a thing that I promised or I believe in, mm -hmm. and it does not have to be a deal breaker. So I think some of this is a play for Iowa. Mm -hmm. And I think some of it, frankly, is a dance that we always do in every primary, which is like, oh, we got to dance over here to the right, and then we're going to come <laughs> on back. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure how much of that is unique to him, but I do think it poses a challenge, particularly, and he's made this argument, he says, like, suburban voters were his bread and butter mm -hmm. in Florida. So again, you go back to that roadmap and say, okay, well, how did we win those folks? And the question is, did you win them with these messages mm -hmm. or did you win them with a different message? Because eventually you're going to have to get back to winning them because you don't win the presidency without those suburban collars of all these major metro centers in Virginia, in Pennsylvania, in Arizona, in Georgia, especially Georgia. So I think it becomes a challenge for him, but it's a challenge that most primary most people in a competitive primary must deal with at some point. We like to conclude with book recommendations. So, Mary Catherine Ham, what are your book recommendations? Oh, yes. Um, okay, so my favorite, maybe my favorite book of all time is Wise Blood by Flannery O'Connor. Mm -hmm. It's just like the right amount creepy and Christian and like the Christ-haunted South and mm -hmm. bizarre stuff going on. Also beautifully written. So that's like an American classic. So I just read... The Rules of Civility 
by Amor Tolls. Mm-hmm. Just a beautiful writer. I had also read A Gentleman in Moscow. He's one of those writers that I don't really even care what you're writing. Michael Chabon is similar. The prose is just so good. And then I'll, I'll do a shout out to um, Matthew Continetti's The Right, mm-hmm. which is a history of the American right and conservatism, which will speak to, in a more erudite sense mm-hmm. than I did, many of the things that we have talked about right. in this podcast. That's I, what erudite I read reference. That, um, a couple months ago, and it, it's readable and fair. And even if you just do parts of it, you'll learn things yeah. uh, about the arc of conservatism. I did, and I've been in this for, you know, 25 years or so. Yeah, I, I had a conversation with Matthew a couple of years ago when I was at Vox. And one thing he told me, he was like, well, the challenge is no one really knows what conservatism is. <laughs> I'm like, ah. And well, it's become more and more unclear over yeah. the past several years. What a journey we're all on. Well, Mary Catherine Ham, thank you so much for joining me on The Ezra Klein Show. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. I feel like this it's episode not of the that Ezra Klein hard show to say pretty... what conservatism is, right? I mean, it like, <laughs> like obviously it's you know there there are, there's going to be nuance to it that you're going to miss if you if you try to give any kind of short definition to it. But but it's like most of the time these are the people that are fighting to preserve the power of the status quo in terms of like which demographics and which institutions re- remain in charge. And I think that the the reason that that's you know become troublesome lately is because they haven't been succeeding electorally very much like for the you know for the blast you know outside of 2016 basically um yeah i think i don't know if it's necessarily something that's difficult to answer as much as i think the discussion about it is very interesting and can uh illuminate a lot of stuff Mm -hmm. um so, so, so I think there's a lot of fertile ground for like a book a- a- analyzing it. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Um, I don't have any book recommendations to analyze it. My favorite book is Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, though. So I'll just like randomly throw that out. Um, it's a book about cognitive biases, and I learn. Uh, I think you would learn a lot from it if you don't already know about a lot about those. Um, do you have anything else you want to add, either on this podcast or on the topic or anything? Um, With the caveat that obviously. This person is not representative of all anti-institution stuff. Um, I feel very vindicated. I feel like I came in, you know, I'm very pro trusting institutions, but let's hear what the other side has to say. Well, the other side said some really dumb stuff today. Um, so maybe I'm, I'm sure there are better arguments out there, but I remain very uh, vindicated and, uh, and uh, confirmed in my priors uh, from having gone into this. Um, I, I don't feel like the stuff she said was all that dumb, but I also don't feel like it was anything I haven't heard before. It was it was just sort of like, well, yeah, you said a bunch of stuff that was already baked into my beliefs about how we should have like limited trust in our institutions to begin with mm-hmm. so yeah and, and like um and we do i, I, have... I, I, I don't know I, th- I, th- I think there are a couple things that were really dumb i think it's being like On well the we should trust the fbi because school... mlk and the school closure thing like it's obvious that the schools should have been i don't know whatever um anyways yeah um but no th- uh but but this was this was great um i i super enjoy going over this stuff so great recommendation cricket thank you Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, and, and you know, this, uh, the Ezra Klein show is on the, the New York Times uh, YouTube channel. Um, so, anyway, uh, thanks for joining us. And, uh, yeah. oh, do you want to shout yourself out? For- uh, yeah, twitch.tv slash flowtrace, uh, twitter.com slash flowtrace. Uh, I think I'll, I'm not going to be live after this, but I am live. I think I'll be live sometime later this week with a panel. And I'm live every Wednesday. Okay, thanks. Bye bye. All right, see ya.